So if you would remember to mute your mics. It is 9 a.m. I welcome everyone to our committee meetings for the Board of Trustees for Elizabeth City State University. Uh, the first committee up is the Board of Trustees of the Endowment. And before I call us to order, I would just like to recognize on behalf of all the committees who report out this morning that we appreciate the historic, historic time that we uh, have gathered today. Not only do we have the coronavirus and the global pandemic and how it is impacting world citizens, but our very communities, but also how we are also facing uh, the social justice issues and police violence of the day. And it's with heavy hearts and with great pride that we are here to represent the Vikings uh, with an understanding of what we have as a backdrop as we proceed today with our committee reports. And with that, I call to order the meeting and I ask for Gwen to please do the roll call. Good morning, Board of Trustees of the Endowment Committee. Jan King Robinson. Present. Jimmy Chambers. Present. Andy Culpepper. Present. Chancellor Dixon. Here. Peter Ely. Here. Paul Tyne. Present. And Lisa McClinton. Madam Thank Chair. you, Ms. Sanders. Thank you. And I am going to rely on you, uh, Ms. Sanders, as we all will, to make sure that we're following the directions that you've given us. And as I understand, it is time for me to uh, provide uh, guidance by saying to our committee, as the chair of the committee, I want to remind everyone that we will be conducting today's meeting pursuant to the amendments to the Open Meetings Act that apply during states of emergency. The amendments were signed into law and allow for public bodies to meet via electronic means. The new law does require, however, that we take all votes via roll call, which we will do today. Additionally, pursuant to the amendments to the law, all chats, instant messages, text, or other written communications between members of the board regarding the transaction of the public business during the remote meeting are deemed to be public record. Finally, I will ask all committee members, board members, and participating staff to please identify yourself before participating in deliberations, including making motions, proposed amendments, and raising points of order. Thank you. Also, 
our state ethics acts requires that as chair of the board of trustees of the endowment it is my responsibility to remind all members of the board of their duty under the state government ethics act to avoid conflicts of interest and appearance of conflict of interest as required by this act each member has received the agenda and related information for this board of trustees committee meeting if any board member knows of any conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any matter coming before the Board of Trustees at this meeting, the conflict or appearance of conflict, conflict should be identified at this time. Hearing none, I will ask for approval of the minutes. This is Trustee Colbert. I make a motion that we approve the minutes. Thank you, Trustee oh, Culpepper. May I have a second? This is Paul Tyne, second. Thank you, Trustee Tyne. All in favor? Any objections? Motion carries. All righty. I would like to invite now uh, for our staff liaisons, Vice Chancellor Lisa McClintock, and, all, and also following her, Vice Chancellor Anita Walton, uh, to provide the reports. But before they begin, I'd like to just welcome them once again. We are off and running. We know you have been extremely busy. We've had an opportunity to talk prior to this meeting, and thank you for all of the incredible hard work during these incredibly challenging times. And we look forward to your reports this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's having a great Monday. I'm just going to let Gina, our controller, go over the endowment up. Just screen. Just a second. Good morning. My name is Gina Knight, and I would like to present the endowment information as of March. 31st, 2020, and this um, presentation is for informational purposes only, and there are no action items at this time. The first slide uh, depicts the information as of March 31st, our balances, and also the rate of return from last year at this time until um, March of 2020 this year. And you may refer to your packets for additional information regarding the investment review. Okay, on the next slide, we have the rate of return, the performance overview. Um, as we all know, due to COVID-19, we've um, endured significant decreases. And that's as of March 31st, 2020. But as you see on the next slide for April 30th, 2020, there is a slight uptick. That means that we're bouncing back. Um, we know this progress is going to be slow, but we're looking to come back to where we were um, before the pandemic. Are there any questions? This is Trustee Culpepper. Yes, sir. Uh, at the head of your uh, report, it says June 1st, 2000. And you, you using, you're using March 30th. Yes. Uh, is it all March 30th or, or is that just uh, the June 1st is not correct? Sir, the date that's on the beginning of the um, slide is for the presentation date, which is today. Okay. Okay. The actual information is as of um, quarter in, which would be March 31st. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Chair Robinson, that's all the information that we have for the endowments. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And we will now move to Vice Chancellor Walton for her report. Good morning.
Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to, first of all, begin by saying um, we have, uh, the report that I have um, has been updated from what you received in your packet dated May 7th, because it's been 24 days since you received that um, information and we've had significant change. Um, in collaboration and support of the chancellor, she asked me to make updates so that you would have the most up-to-date information. As I go through the report, I'll do my very best to point out those changes so that you'll know where the information has changed. Um, Madam Chair, um, I um, will now move forward with my report. Thank you. So in this report, I want to cover five areas, um, a review of the first 90 days, um, where we are with our fundraising progress, how uh, Advancement has responded to COVID-19, uh, what we're going to do moving forward, and uh, because our Board of Trustees is a leader in helping us with our fundraising efforts, each board meeting, I'd like to share some fundraising building blocks some concepts related to fundraising to ensure that we can uh, continue to grow and strengthen our partnership. So the first 90 days, um, we've really been looking at, or at least I've been looking at the infrastructure policies and business process within advancement, strengthening advancement services and identifying our gaps within fundraising. Where are we missing um, opportunities and what within the advancement structure do we need to really review and increase? Reviewing the database and our donor information. What do we need to collect on our donors? We've also developed the Reimagine Robot campaign. I hope that each of you have seen the campaign and I hope that each of you have had an opportunity to support the campaign. We've had a review of the division resources and the utilization and we've been exploring where we might be able to tap into resources within the system and where we can benchmark and learn from our peers within the system. We've also been looking at what we need to do to prepare for FY21. After this meeting, we'll have one more, one month, and then we'll launch into um, FY21. And then of course, although um, we are in a pandemic and we've not been able to do a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, meetings, we have been trying to, at least I've been trying to use uh, Zoom to meet with key donors, lead volunteers, alumni, and community leaders whenever possible. So beginning to look at the numbers, and these numbers are um, up to date as of yesterday. Um, and so you'll see here, we have a comparison of May 31st, 2020 to FY20 and May 31st, FY19. Um, if you are comparing to what you've seen um, in your packet, you'll notice that we have had a jump in alumni giving in that comparison. And you'll also notice that there has been um, uh, not, not a significant um, increase, but um, you, have, you will see that that's probably the biggest one in terms of the chart. I want to bring to your attention that there's been a change, a decrease in the foundation bars. Those numbers have switched a little bit. In the beginning of my report, I mentioned that we've been looking at the database and this could have happened um, before my arrival particularly when you start talking about, um, or, or during my arrival, when you start talking about a comparison of month to month for FY20 and FY19, each of these constituency codes here, um, they, um, those, are, are, those do not change, but you may put a gift in under an incorrect constituency code one month, and then you may correct it the next month. So on your report, you may have seen 12 and it's 11. It just means that it was corrected to the right constituency code. Comparison of um, the dollars. So, but com comparison of the dollars, 
um, you'll see where um, FY20, we're slightly up in alumni giving. Um, and that is probably the largest um, area. Where you'll see our significant jump is in our uh, foundation uh, giving for FY20, which is different from the report that you received May 7th. We received two uh, grants since the May 7th report, which uh, it, it, it caused our, um, our, in the last 24 days for our amount there to increase. So in FY20, FY19, comparison of the totals, in FY19, we're around 1 million, and in FY20, we're at one, currently we're at 1.1 million. And my understanding that our goal for FY20 is 1.1 million, so at this time, we are currently past our goal. And then finally, um, a comparison of the donors. In your report um, previously, I believe we were, we had more donors and less money, um, and we are now have uh, less donors and um, more money. <clears throat> Before I go on, I wanted to ask if there were any questions about that, or we can wait until the end. Madam Chair, which would you prefer? Trustees, feel free to acknowledge. You can let me know if you have a question and we'll proceed. We can question as we go along. Any questions from the trustees? Okay, thank you. Go ahead and proceed, Vice okay. Chancellor. All right, so our fundraising uh, progress by leadership the two boards that we are reporting on are our Board of Trustees, FY20 Giving. And after meeting with the chair and the chancellor, we wanted to um, ensure that we were um, recognizing um, giving of all kinds and influence with our board. And so we have 92.30% uh, giving, but we wanted to share uh, what we've classified as facilitated gifts. And these facilitated gifts are a way that we are describing um, what we, we are describing um, how philanthropic support from our leadership is, um, is given to the university. You can see here a written definition. Um, it is a way for leadership, our leadership board to help us achieve support through their relationships advocacy and engagement. And these gifts may come in various forms. They may be through a matching company. They may be through some type of um, advocacy within our a government agency or through a foundation. To date, you'll see we have um, identified $5,241,757 in facilitated gifts. Yes. Vice Chancellor Walton, may we just take a moment? I just would like to acknowledge uh, our trustees in both their giving and in their facilitated gifts. I know that the staff is with me when we say high five, virtual high five to everyone. Uh, just really delighted uh, at the level of engagement and work that our board of trustees have been involved in this year. So thank you all. And I would like to um, thank you as well, because it really is helpful um, when our leadership boards, uh, as we go to more publicly recognizing uh, our donors, when they're able to see your names on those lists. And you'll see our foundation board as well, and the dollar amount there and the participation level. Vice Chancellor Walton, um, can you also mention the foundation board facilitated gifts? Ely is aware. I can. I will. I will include those uh, moving forward. So our fundraising progress, um, the Reimagine Robux campaign, which is the campaign that uh, supports our uh, football field project and will support future projects surrounding the Robux Stadium. Our goal is $250,000, and we've raised 
$5,301 toward the campaign. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, how that fundraising has gone and is going as uh, we talk about and I mentioned the uh, day of giving. Oh, sorry. All right, so um, Friday, May 29th, just a few days ago, we had our annual day of giving, our fourth annual day of giving. And this year, one thing that was a little different about our day of giving was that we hosted it for just a full 24 hours. And we wanted to uh, focus our day of given, giving on the football field project or reimagine your book. We asked donors to support this project in particular, although donors could redirect their, their gifts to another area if they so desired. You see the number there, 121.50. Uh, that number is as of yesterday. The 113 indicates the number based on uh, 3, p 3 a.m. Pacific time on Friday evening. It also takes out anyone who redirected their gift to another designation and also fees that are charged by the merchant uh, for credit card processing. We um, will certainly reconcile all of the gifts, ensuring that um, we put all of our donors, our information into our banner system to uh, make sure that um, we have a final count. This information um, and the opportunity to give is still available. We aren't going to take it down um, probably until the end of the week. We have one more opportunity to uh, directly solicit um, donors, and that is with our year-end solicitation. And this, is, this will be a segmented solicitation. For uh, that solicitation, we will be uh, reaching out to individuals who gave last year, alumni and friends, but have not given this year. Um, so our response to COVID-19 and advancement. We developed a student assistance fund and we collected $28,280. And these are some of the, in addition to uh, individual gifts, we received gifts from um, ASG at the system office, and they were supported by the following uh, foundations. We also hosted a virtual Q&A with the chancellor and the provost to answer questions uh, from alumni and friends regarding how the university was addressing the various challenges related to COVID. And we've made stewardship calls to donors just to check in with them, to let them know that we're thinking about them and asking them how they're doing. So what are we going to do moving forward? Um, as we uh, look at the overall plan and what's been discovered, we'll set an overall goal for fundraising for FY21. Um, we'll work with a goal for our individual fundraisers and we'll determine what gift types we need to prioritize, annual, major, planned, and endowments. We'll develop an engagement strategy for alumni community and business or corporate. Um, our FY goal and how will we get there, we'll determine that. We'll review the data from FY 20, 19, and 18. We'll determine the percentage amount that we want to increase based on our dollars and we'll set measurable goals for each of our fundraisers. These goals will not just be dollar goals so that we won't have to wait until the end of the year to determine our progress. We'll look at dollars, we'll look at new prospects, we'll look at the number of proposals written to donors, the number of visits, virtual visits, if we are still in a, a pandemic, the percentage of cash increase from current donors, the number of endowments, the number of new donors or planned gifts. All of these are ways to measure success. Organizational um, and division infrastructure, um, identifying the areas that we need to support um, our fundraising objectives. So for example, annual giving, that's an area of weakness for us. So we'll need, we'll need to change infrastructure 
uh, to support and increase annual giving. Um, revised uh, positions to cover all of the functional areas that are priorities within advancement and align activities to support those goals. Uh, we need to update um, our agreements, policies, and procedures uh, to align with our operations and maintain compliance. And we'll want to work collaboratively with our board, our board chair, our leaders, and um, in the roles and responsibilities that I have as executive director. Um, you probably have heard for uh, the last year that we'll be going to, a we're going through a conversion from Banner to Razor's Edge Next. Um, that transition is going very well. Uh, we are beginning to migrate data. We're beginning to train and we are scheduled to be completely uh, transitioned and go live by July 30th. So now we're at the uh, building blocks part that I mentioned. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about advancement services um, and uh, the four areas of advancement services, database management, prospect management, gift processing and administration, stewardship and donor relations. So for um, the database management, uh, basically that is involves you know, maintaining records, which you probably assume we are really only as good as our records the addresses, the phone numbers, email addresses, all of those things. Um, those things allow us to strengthen our solicitation and our stewardship. And the database management also involves security and privacy. And those are the areas that we will increase and that we want to get training on. We wanna identify and clean up database uh, duplicate records. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are PCI compliant. And those things are also a part of database management. Um, in the area of prospect management, we want to look at research, uh, researching our prospects. We want to make sure that we look at wealth screenings. A lot of times when we say wealth screenings, um, it is generally thought that we're only looking at uh, capacity to give, but wealth screenings include capacity, propensity, and affinity. So we can look at all three of those things, and that can help us strengthen our relationship with potential donors. Gift processing and administration. This is an area where we are able to really um, kind of build a trust and transparency with our donors. As uh, advancement professionals, it is really up to us to, to learn and understand the IRS rules and regulations and case standards on accepting gifts and be knowledgeable and astute to understand gift acceptance policies. We need to be sure that we understand when we take gifts, um, how they should be administered, um, and when we sign agreements, what the rules are, that they're properly recorded, and that we are um, receiving them in a way and recognizing the donors appropriately. And so I'll just stop there. Um, uh, one more thing, stewardship and um, donor relations. And this is an area where um, we, we are beginning to um, grow. Um, you may have noticed with the Reimagine Roebuck campaign, um, we had a donor honor roll. And um, I can say that it has um, assisted us with recognizing donors and our um, and increasing uh, giving too, I believe. The um, campaign uh, has brought in large group donors um, over the day of giving. Uh, we had several people who uh, would call and say, I've given and I don't see my name. I want to make sure that my name is there. Um, it is also an area where we uh, can grow and, and it's not always something that requires uh, something that's given. It may be an opportunity um, to, have to build a relationship. So stewardship is about the uh, gift. Donor relationship is a donor relationship is about the donor. I'll stop now and um, answer any questions. Um, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Walton. Any questions or comments, trustees? Madam Chair, Trustee uh, Tyne has raised his hand. Okay, thank you. Trustee Tyne, please, you have the floor. Thanks, Madam Chair. This is Paul Tyne, and um, I have a couple of questions. The first is, 
Um, on the number of donors, it says, uh, you said that we're down. Is that uh, due to reclassification of some of the, you know, some of the input in the system? Or, you know, do we think that has to do with COVID, you know, the stress on people's financial lives right now? Um, we're just looking to see where that was. So this comparison is May 31st, um, 19 to May 31st, 20. Um, one of the reasons why I believe it may be down is due to reconciliation of giving day, the day of giving. We have added the dollars, but in the reconciliation, the gifts are not in the banner system. The dollars have been added. So the, all of the donors have not been added. So this number may increase. Um, that's one reason. The other reason is because um, there may be a slight decline due to the pandemic. But I would say the number one reason is probably because we were able to easily include the dollars, but not the donors for the day of giving. Okay, thank you. And then again, this is Paul Tahan. And um, can we get, since we're nearing the end here, can we get an update? I, I would find it helpful for me to have an update to make sure I know what was given this year for myself and make sure it's all accounted for as we're moving over the system. So, um, and I, you know, some other trustees might also find that to be helpful as we head into the, the year as we have uh, tasked ourselves with meeting some goals uh, at the board of trustees and just make sure that we're holding up to that individually. Yes, I think, I'm sorry. No, thank you. I appreciate that, Trustee Time, because one of the things that we do is we do get from the university, from the Advancement Office, a statement for the calendar year. However, since we're on a different year, fiscal year with the university, I, I think that would be very helpful to the individual trustees to get a statement as to where we are for the uh, university fiscal year. I can do that. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Trustee Harold Barnes, who has his hand up. Trustee Barnes. Good morning, fellow trustees and uh, vice chancellor. Um, what will the new um, beta program allow you to do that you cannot do with the old program? And uh, do you have any projections in terms of percentages as to how it will improve um, your fundraising efforts? Um, I'll two questions. And so thank you. I'm glad that you asked. So the RE Next program will allow us to do a number of things um, operationally that I think will enhance our efforts. Uh, first of all, um, it is more intuitive um, than Banner. Um, when you look at it, you'll be able to um, really kind of um, almost kind of look at it. And although we will have lots of training, um, it is almost like you know, Microsoft Word. So it'll be very familiar um, to you. Um, and so that's one thing. The other thing is it is really easy um, to, much easier than Banner, to keep customer relation information. Um, the tabs in terms of information that you can track for the various donors um, is uh, more robust than Banner. So um, that is helpful. Um, on the gift processing side, um, I'm going to give you an example of a process for online giving. One now that we have to take an online gift from one system and put that information into another system. So one system, take that information, put it into another system and reconcile it. Um, Razor's Edge has its own merchant account. And so when the information comes over to the system in a batch, it will look at the system and it will say, oh, there are three Anita Waltons. And this gift of $10 is from Anita. Which Anita would you like? And it will allow you to click. And this Anita has uh, the same address, but it looks like there's a new phone number. 
And do you want to capture this phone number? And you will click yes or no. And this Anita doesn't have an email address, but I see this online gift has an email address and you will click to capture the email address. And it'll do that for every single gift that comes in through that online system. So it really gives you an opportunity to increase the quality of your record with every gift that you receive. And the at the end of that, you will be able to close that, that your system will update with all of this information that you've captured. It doesn't require a human to say, oh, let me check to make sure I have, do we have good address from this? Oh, oh here's a phone number that I can capture or email address. A human doesn't have to re remember that because the system is going to automatically ask you, um, do you want it? Um, the batch will close, that information will be saved. So that, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that we will be able to do a lot of things with affinity and build um, email um, to communicate with our donors. Now, the email system that we use, when we send an email out, it goes to however number of hundreds of individuals. We don't know exactly who we're talking to. Um, we know they're alumni, we know they're good friends, but Razor's Edge will allow us to build an email and we will be able to pull a query based on affinity. We can say we want everyone from the class of 63 who hasn't given a gift to get this message so we can speak directly to them. Or we want everyone who um, played football to receive this email so that we can ask them specifically to give to this football project. So we can capture more information on donors and we can speak directly to those donors, which means that um, the customization of the ask uh, will, be, will be better, um, which means that um, you can have build a better relationship. So those are two things. Um, very easily. And of course, the data analytics that we already do, those things will be enhanced. So in terms of percentage um, of increase of gift, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm happy to inquire because I can't imagine that that information is not out there and get back to you. That's, thank that you. Uh, one last thing. Uh, if you were meeting with a donor in the field and can you, would, will you be able to access that donor's record while you're sitting there with them talking about a future gift? Yes, sir. This um, Razor's Edge Next is a web-based product. Um, I believe we can actually do that now with Banner. So that, that's not new. Um, so that, that's not a new feature, um, but it, it is something that um, we will be able to do. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, trustee. We'd now like to both recognize and welcome our newest trustee. Uh, welcome, trustee Jimmy Chambers. You have the floor. Hey, thank you, uh, trustee uh, Robertson. Um, and good morning to everyone. Um, quick question that I have for VC uh, one is that um, you mentioned the $121,000 that is of to today. I was wondering if that was in judgment to what was raised during the CIAA. Um, sure, I, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was gonna make sure I understood your question. Like that, the 121,000 was that just for the actual one day of giving that was held, or was that in also with what was raised during CIAA? Yes. So um, to clarify and, and make sure that everyone is uh, clear, the $121,000 from the day of giving includes money, all monies that were was has, that has been raised for the football field project. So money from CIAA, monies that were have been raised through any email solicitations, any groups that have provided dollars, individual giving all money. So yes, it does include money from CIAA. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We have a question, a uh, hand raised on the floor from our chancellor. Chancellor, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just gonna add to um, Trustee Barnes's question in regards to what Razor Edge will do for us. And 
just wanted to reiterate that um, Razor's Edge is going to be a game changer for us. And all of you may be aware that the UNC Board of Governors put in place the HMSI committee that's being chaired by Governor Daryl Allison. And the focus of that committee initially was to really look at the smaller campuses within the UNC system. So the HBCUs, Asheville, Western, School of the Arts, and others who um, they're gonna be focused on ways in which they can support and grow advancement offices. And we see advancement um, very different across the system. And uh, what they also determined is that our smaller campuses just don't have the resources to purchase uh, software like Razor's Edge and other things to help us enhance our advancement efforts. And so uh, they asked for a $5 million um, allocation and that $5 million allocation is going to these campuses to implement Razor's Edge. So this is a great thing for us. Um, we do have to, our staff will have to be trained. They've already started some training, but as Anita mentioned, they will continue the training um, to the end of the month. And, you know, I just, I'm excited about this because I think this is gonna level or help to level the playing field. One other piece that I wanna mention with advancement that they discovered is, you know, advancement offices are various sizes across the UNC system. And actually at ECSU, we have the smallest advance, advancement office with only four permanent um, employees and then some half-time or, or temp employees. Whereas we have some advancement offices in the system that are have employees greater than 25 people working on um, advancement services. So this will help us. Um, and as we continue to grow at the university, then of course our um, operating dollars can go toward looking at ways that we can grow our advancement staff to really help us continue to grow our fundraising efforts and, and all the advancement services that are provided within this division. So just wanted to mention that, uh, Trustee Barnes, um, you're right on point with what we can actually do with this um, software and we're very excited about it, but we have to get trained and we have to utilize it. And we hope that the uh, HMSI committee continues to focus on ways in which to help uh, the smaller campuses raise money. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, Trustee Barnes, I still see your hand raised. Are you fine? Uh, any other comments or questions? Madam Chairman, I'm fine. Yes. I'm yes, thank you. And Trustee Culpepper, please proceed. Uh, along with Trustee Barnes and uh, the question about the software that we're in, in, installing. Um, I'm hoping that this software will allow us to identify all the alumni, and I assume, Anita, that they will become prospects if they have not never given. Would that be correct? Yes, sir. So we can therefore identify all our alumni. Yes, sir. Um, that is and something. Yes, sir. So then, then we would be able to click on a, a query and say, pull up all our alumni. We would be able to, um, it would help so us. I don't think we've been able to at least, go ahead. Well, it would help us um, enhance our database, which is something that we've already um, started to do. Um, I mentioned in the beginning of the report, um, analyzing the data. Um, we began to, well, we've begun to already uh, look at um, gaps in the data. So in the database, um, what's, what's missing? Are there class years that are missing? Are there majors that are missing? Um, are there, um, um, whatever is missing, we are trying to identify um, that information and reaching out to the appropriate office, if it's the registrar's office, to fill that information in. So, for example, when you mentioned reaching out to our alumni, you know, we want to be strategic in that. So, we may have alumni who are in the database, but we don't know which um, department or college they graduated from. So, we want to fill that gap so that with this new um, um, Razor's Edge, um, software, 
if we want to send a newsletter to everyone in the College of Education and Psychology, we can do that. We can communicate with all of those individuals, but we want to first know that they're alumni. We want to know that they graduated with those degrees. So um, yes, we can, we can enhance our database. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can I respond to the, the chancellor's question about manpower? You know, one way to judge the uh, manpower is to uh, judge the money raised per person working on that effort. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. Thank you. Trustee Kenneth Wilkins, I see your hand raised, sir. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Uh, my, my question is to Anita is, uh, Madam Chair, during this uh, pandemic, do you, how hard do you think it's going to be for us to uh, to meet our mi mission on where we need to be for is fundraising? And also, I want to know uh, this Razor Edge software, will it also, will we be able to put in corporations that can, that we can be, we can contact? Uh, and also, do we have, have letters or any type of letters to uh, mail out to different uh, givers that's given. There's a lot of a lot of people giving, but we just have to tell the story on why we need this money. So you know, we you know, so th those are some of the things I always have talked about is sending out letters to people because we never know who really wants to give money to us because we are HBCU, we are a University that in a in an area where they're tier one area, and we definitely need uh, to ask. And you you know you don't never ask. We won't ever receive from these these people that have this money that they just give, and you can see it every day over the over TV or everywhere that they're giving hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars, so and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions. But we just gotta ask, and if we could formulate some type of asking letter, and then we always can also have, maybe someone will have some contact to this corporation. If we had a list of these corporations that that we thought that would, that uh, is sensible to our needs. Uh, and that's basically, you know, what I wanted to, uh, you know, said to you. Okay. So, um, first of all, I, I um, will, will, um, schedule some time to have a conversation with you to a more depth com conversation with you about these things, but to succinctly just address the th three things, um, challenges of fundraising in the pandemic, um, corporate contacts and um, uh, solicitations to our donors. Um, within the pandemic, certainly there are challenges. I mean, we hear about them every day, but we do know that um, there are individuals who are passionate about various causes and people remain philanthropic. Um, we, we know that people are giving and supporting. And um, so it will be challenging. So we'll have to be strategic. And I'll say that in that short answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk further um, when, when we schedule the time to have a conversation. As far as corporate contacts, um, I do believe that this system will allow us to have that. Um, one, we have matching gifts. We have matching gifts. We have great matching gifts. And those are opportunities. Um, you all as board members um, have relationships and we are able to work very closely with you to um, leverage those opportunities. And certainly that information will be in the Razor's Edge system um, so that we can um, include that data to uh, determine what the next steps are with those uh, corporations. Also, um, their databases. Uh, we have uh, gone to a database recently um, donor search that has given us 700 foundations and corporations that are giving specifically uh, for causes within the pandemic. They, they want to focus on that. We're reviewing it and determining which ones we need to focus on. So, you know, we, we have those. We also have alumni who are doing these corporate matches and we can talk with them based on their roles within the organization. Um, letters, you're talking about segmented solicitation. Again, I, I mentioned that a little bit about um, 
what Razor's Edge will allow us to do. So, so certainly we'll be able to do that and, and, and tell the story, as you mentioned, um, in greater detail and speak to the individual based on their individual passion. Thank you. Thank you, VC. Uh, I just want to make sure I see Chancellor, your hand is raised. Is that uh, you just haven't taken your hand down or do you have something else you'd like to add to the discussion? Oh, no, I just need to take it down. Okay, very good. All righty, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, thank VC Walton for this very informed update, very encouraging. I'd like to let our trustees know that uh, VC Walton has already started talking to us and I've talked to several of you and I know that you look forward to talking to her and talking about particular prospects and some insight you have to help us raise funds for the university. I do need to go back. I neglected to take a roll on our minutes and we had a motion, we had a second, but I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Sanders to do roll call so that we have roll on our uh, minutes. Approval of minutes. Approval of our minutes. Thank you. Yes. And so I will repeat the um, committee name. Please just um, indicate your approval of the minutes. Um, trustees Jan King Robinson. Yes, here. Yes, for, for the minutes. Jimmy Chambers. Uh, yes. Andy Culpepper. Yes, ma'am. Chancellor Dixon. Approved. Thank you. Peter Ely. Peter Ely. Approved. Thank you. Approved. Paul Tyne. Aye. And Lisa McClinton. Approved. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And thank you for your continuing support and helping us uh, follow the script. So I now would like to, without objection, uh, adjourn the meeting. And at this time, I'm going to turn everything over to our chair, our vice chair, uh, Lynn Bunch, for uh, chairing the Academic and Enrollment Services Committee. Trustee Bunch. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. As chair of the committee, I want to remind everyone that we will be conducting today's meeting pursuant to the new amendments to the Open Meetings Act that apply during states of emergency. The amendments were signed into law and allow for public bodies to meet via electronic means. The new law does require, however, that we take all votes via roll call, which we will do today. Additionally, pursuant to the amendments to the law, all, all chats, instant messages, texts, or written communications between members of the board regarding the transaction of the public business during the remote meeting are deemed a public record. Finally, I will ask all committee members, board members, and participating staff to please identify yourself before participating in deliberations including making motions, proposing amendments, and raising points of order. And now I'd like to remind everyone of the committee ethics uh, statement. As chair of the academic and enrollment services, it is my responsibility to remind all members of the board of their duty under the State Government Ethics Act to avoid conflicts of interest and appearances of conflicts of, of interest as required by this act. Each member has received the agenda and related information for this Board of Trustees Committee meeting. If any board member knows of any conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any matter coming before the Board of Trustees at this meeting, the conflict or appearance of conflict should be identified at this time. And no one has does you have a conflict? Okay, so at this time, do I have um, a motion for the approval of minutes from our last meeting? Excuse me, um, Vice Chair uh, Bunch, we should do roll call. Roll call, okay. And I will, okay. So for academic and enrollment services, trustees Lynn Bunch. Present. Harold Barnes. Present. Bruce Brown. 
Present. Chris Evans. Present. Stephanie Johnson. Present. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Do we have a second? Second. second. Okay, um, we've heard the motion. Or is there any discussion or debate? If not, we will vote via roll call and I will call on Gwen Sanders to call the roll and record the vote. This is the vote for the minutes. Lynn Bunch. Approve. Harold Barnes. Aye. Bruce Brown. Approve. Chris Evans. Approve. Stephanie Johnson. Approved. Thank you. Okay, we have no uh, items for action this month, uh, but we have had an extremely busy time since March. And at this time, I'd like to call on Vice Chancellor uh, Ward to- Madam, uh -huh. Madam Chair, I'm sorry, point of order real quick. And okay. I know I'm not on the committee, but um, I think we have to wait. And, and I, I'm sorry that you went through all the things. I think we have to wait until the announced time in order to um, meet the requirements of the public meeting laws? Okay, what, what time? I don't have a one. Nine, no, it's it's 945, so we're good. Oh, I thought it said 10 in the agenda. Yeah, we no, we changed, uh, we remember we sent an updated um, list. Okay, sorry, I was looking at the paper one. I'm That's so okay. glad you didn't have to redo it. All right. You're fine, I'm, no, you're I'm fine. Gonna, Thank I'm you, no, we updated that, yes. Okay, so at this time, mm -hmm. I'll call on Vice Chancellor Ward. Thank you so much, Trustee Bunch. Uh, let me share my screen. As Trustee Bunch indicated, we have been very busy, of course, um, since our last meeting. And so, of course, you all probably can guess the first slide which is um, our road to reaffirmation. And so that, that continues. We will still have our virtual on-site visit. We were initially scheduled to have a face-to-face -face visit in the end of May, but we have changed to a virtual on-site visit with our SACS vice president. That will be held on June the 24th. And so we actually will send him an initial uh, specific items that we would like our vice president to review. We will send that by Friday, and then we will have our virtual visit on June 24th. Our compliance report is still due on September the 8th, and so they did not make any modifications to the date of the class of 2021 compliance report due dates. I will just note that SACS initially indicated that they were going to have their summer institute in July in Florida. We got an email, I believe, on Thursday indicating that that would be canceled. Um, our off-site peer review is still due on November 3rd, and our quality enhancement plan and on-site, at least for right now, are still on schedule. And so the biggest date is that September the 8th date is when our compliance report is due. I'll go over just a little bit just to give the trustees an outline of how we made this transition to remote learning. I intentionally called it remote learning because it's not online learning, which is quite different from what we did. And so I'll go through a timeline. The beginning, the first meeting I had with the faculty was actually March 5th. It was pretty obvious to me that the climate across the country was leaning towards potentially moving to remote learning situation. And so I wanted to meet with the faculty. At that time, um, we have about 145 faculty teaching in the spring, about 110 full-time or tenure, tenure track, and then another 35 or so adjuncts. At that time, about 41 of our uh, faculty members were teaching online. So out of about 145, only 41 were teaching online. We had about 65 who were at least gone through the training at that point. And so that initial meeting was just to kind of give them a heads up that it, it, it could happen. Um, I, 
discuss some of the information that was going on across the country and just wanted to give them an idea that, you know, start preparing for that mindset in case it did go that way. On March 11th, um, that's when we officially announced as the university, the chancellor announced that we would indeed transition to remote learning. And then on March 12th, I had a second meeting with the faculty, this time actually in fine arts, to promote social distancing. So that rapidly, from March 5th to March 12th, we had begun practicing social distancing. On March 18th, I sent an email out to the students regarding their technology needs. I think we realized quite early that not all students would have access to computers or even internet or hotspots. And so we sent an email out to the students asking for their technology needs. In a later slide, I'll share with you a breakdown of the technology that we ended up mailing out to students to help them progress through the spring semester. And then on March 19th, which was a Thursday, we actually begun spring break early. And so we wanted to give faculty at some time, a few days to try to work on transitioning. One of the benefits I think we had here at Elizabeth City State was that our spring break was really late in the semester. And so we went to spring break on Thursday and then faculty were all for an entire week of spring break and then we began. On March 25th, I also sent, began sending out weekly Wednesday updates to the faculty. Um, I think that they were quite helpful to try to keep faculty understanding where we were in the uh, pipeline. And if they did raise questions throughout the week, I tried to address them in, our, in my weekly updates. On March 26th, we implemented an emergency grading policy. I'll also talk about a couple of other policies that we changed in order to address this sudden transition to remote learning. On March 27th, we set up a Viking Success at ECSU email address. One of the things that we recognize is that students really kind of needed a place to go if they had concerns. And while in face-to-face, -face, we would say, okay, you can go to this office or that office. We really wanted a centralized email that any student could call, could email about anything, whether it was um, something about their books or if they needed computer access, even if they were having an issue with one of their instructors, and then we would farm out to the appropriate office from that single email address. And so all of that is still before remote instruction began, which was on March 30th. And so that was the first day of the remote instruction. Also on March 30th, we launched an online advising protocol. And I'll tell you what we found is that um, that online advising protocol really bared out fruit Last year, we had a record-breaking pre-registration numbers. We had pre-registered 81% of our students, whereas the year before, we had only pre-registered 58% of our students. This semester, even though we were online, even though students had to meet with their advisors virtually, we actually broke last year's record and have pre-registered 83% of our students. So I, of course, thank you know, the faculty all of their hard, hard work adjusting to that online advising protocol. On April 3rd, we mo had a syllabi modification. One of the things we recognized is that it was important to let students know what how things were changing within their course, whether or not it was going to, you know, maybe they had reduced some of the assignments um, in some of the lab courses, maybe some of the things were going to go online, some of the percentages that they initially indicated in their first syllabi and they may have made modifications to. And so we really requested each faculty member submit a syllabi modification. This modification actually um, has been shared with the UNC system and other institutions have adopted uh, our standard that we developed. On April 7th, we moved summer school online. And so this summer, all of our summer school courses are offered online. First, sec first session, first five weeks, second five weeks, and then we have an extended eight-week session. All of those are offered online this summer. Another positive indication for us is this summer, our summer school enrollment is actually up 26%, which again is another positive sign for us. 
some of the things that people may not think about, but we had to, again, convert to this online environment were faculty evaluations. And so we developed um, a system within Blackboard in order to allow faculty to submit their evaluations. We also had uh, a last component of a promotion and tenure. And so I think my staff, they ended up having to scan whole uh, notebooks so that individuals could review the promotion and tenure documents online. And so we were doing, we did that in mid-April. Another thing, and I'm sure others will discuss this, is that there have been positive things that have come out of this sudden remote learning and COVID-19. And one of them, I just had a meeting with the faculty senate on Friday, is that we realized that we've, for promotion and tenure, we've collected these notebooks for some year and they have to go from committee to committee. We are really going to invest in an online promotion and tenure and annual review system so that faculty members can do that all um, remotely. And we will continue with that even once we return to face to face. Another positive from the COVID-19 is on April 22nd. We also launched Adobe Sign Electronic Signatures that allows students to submit and faculty to submit forms and they don't have to move from office to office. Again, of course, that was not, it's not um, even an option right now, but that's another system that we will continue and will enhance our student even when we return to face-to-face. -face. In terms of policies, here are a few of the policies and changes we made in reaction to COVID-19. The first one was that we extended the last day to withdraw. Again, March 30th was the first day of classes in the remote learning format. And we recognized that some of the students, if they had to make a decision by April 30th, because they didn't know what the courses would look like, they may be prompted to withdraw. And so because of that, we extended that deadline till April 10th. We actually did not see an uptick in withdrawals, which was an extremely positive thing. The other thing I discussed was the emergency grading policy. And when that was implemented, that was a decision to allow students to opt into a pass fail for any of their courses. And so students all received grades at the end of the semester, but they have the option to either take a pass for the course instead of the grade or to take a fail F for the, for the course. But if they take the fail F from pass fail, that would not be calculated in their grade point average. Students have until June 30th in order to make the decision if they would like to opt into the pass fail. Uh, two other policies that we changed were the withdrawal limit. The system office uh, initially has a withdrawal limit. Students can only withdraw from 15 credits a semester. Uh, throughout their whole college career, whether that's four years, five years, they can only withdraw for 15 credits. Similarly, they have a repeat policy, which when you repeat a course, if you get a higher grade, then it will factor into your GPA and that lower grade will be removed. There's also a 15 credit cap on how many courses they can repeat. And so both of those policies were waived. And so any course that was taken during this spring semester, students have the option to basically, they won't count towards their withdrawal or repeat limit. I discussed the technology loaner program. That was a collaboration between academic affairs and IT. And we deployed our first piece of equipment on March 27th. One of the things that we found very early is while, you know, we as a university, the executive cabinet, we were not really concerned with the finances. At this point, we were willing to, um, to spend whatever money we had to spend in order to make sure students could progress successfully and have the technology they need. We didn't even know that there would be funds coming into this to help us with this. It was just what our decision was. The problem though was that, as you can imagine, that we were not the only institution across the country or even across the world who had moved to remote learning. And so it was quite difficult in order to uh, attain the computers that were backlogs and definitely the hotspots. We tried to get hotspots from AT&T, for example, 
We initially thought we were going to get an order in on from Friday that we're going to be delivered by Tuesday. We got a message from our representative on Monday saying that they were not selling any hot spots to any vendors and they were keeping them all for hospitals. And so we had a lot of things that we had to do on campus. One of them was we basically found all the laptops that we had on campus and IT worked with us to reconfigure them for us to mail them out. Uh, for hotspots, we went to specific stores in Virginia in Edenton. Um, I, my staff worked to just pay for a single hotspot here, one here, two here in order to get enough. In fact, at the very last minute, we could not get any hotspots. And so uh, for three, I think three or five students, we actually uh, paid their phone bill for two months. Again, it was just $100 so that they could turn their, their cell phone into an unlimited hotspot. So these are just the numbers, 64 laptops deployed, six desktops for individual students who were allowed to stay on campus. I'm sure VC Brown will discuss that. And then for hotspots, we had about 35 deployed. The last thing is just a quote from one of the students. I think that this really kind of speaks to, again, where we were as a university to try to do everything we could to assist the students. So I wanna say thank you so much for helping me in any way possible. Without you and the other staff I was in contact with, I would not be able to say I passed all my classes. And that really is what it's all about in the end. Um, later on, we did get uh, some specific money, and so the CARES Act was one of those. This specific one that I'll discuss today is the student aid from CARES Act, and so we did receive funding from the Department of Education to assist students with expenses related to the disruption due to coronavirus. Um, we got $1.065 million dollars. And it was clear in the legislation that this money could go, had to go directly to students. Uh, it could not be if they had a bill or they had a parking ticket, we could not pay the university and then pay the student the rest. The money had to go directly to students. And so we delivered it to undergraduate and graduate students. They also had to be enrolled in face-to-face -face courses, distance education and non-degree seeking international students were not eligible. And so the chart below just has a breakdown of how we disperse the money. Um, we went on the EFC, that's expected family contribution. That's a score that you receive when you, re when you complete the FAFSA. That was another requirement of the legislation that the students had to be eligible to receive student aid. It didn't matter if they were gonna get it or not, it, they just had to be eligible. And so even if individuals um, had made a significant EFC score and were not eligible to re to actually be dispersed money, but if they um, could have, they could have gotten financial aid, they also received funds. And so the breakdown uh, really stops at 5576. And that money was, that number was chosen because that's actually the cap for Pell eligible. And so that's why that disbursement looks like that. And so a total of 1,327 of our student population received some type of financial assistance uh, through this CARES money. So that's a great, great percentage of our population that received some. And you can see the awards range from $1,000 to $307.50. We still have $6.50 that uh, VC McClinton and myself are trying to figure out who we will disperse it so we can spend every dollar of the money that they gave us. So um, now we're just at a position where now we have to shift to fall 2020 reintegration and how we will accomplish that. On May 5th, I implemented an academic reintegration committee that consists of uh, faculty senate chair, as well as faculty from every school and our director of distance education to really start thinking about how we were gonna to begin to make this transition to the fall semester. Um, I also held a general faculty meeting virtually on fall 2020 to update the faculty on where we are and spend about 30 minutes answering all the questions that they had to try to 
make sure that their questions were really answered. One of the things that we did first was implemented a file, a reintegration faculty survey. Uh, it was pretty obvious that our intent is to move classes back online in the fall, but we recognize that individuals, particularly our faculty, will have, um, you know, whether they're in a CDC kind of high risk categories, whether it's because of their age or maybe their pre-existing health conditions. And so I wanted to give the faculty an opportunity to let me know if they were in one of those situations. And if they were, then we would transition them to online if possible. And so we collected that information. We were able to accommodate every faculty member, about 30 faculty member indicated that they needed accommodations for the fall between May 18th and May 22nd. We did phase one of that modifications to the schedules, which transitioned those faculty from face-to-face -face courses to online courses. Um, over the May, between May 18th and May 29th, we also had to do a classroom inventory. We took pictures of every single classroom on campus because of course, the CDC guidelines indicate that there still should be social distancing within the classrooms. And so we recognize that we have large classes, maybe 40, 45 students, and they may be in a classroom that seats 40 or 45 kids, but that is really not gonna be, you're not gonna be able to social distance in that environment. And so we will have to make some accommodations. And so between this week, um, I'm, if hopefully we can finish by Friday, we will start phase two of the schedule adjustments. And some of that will be moving classes who are in a room that has 30 students in it to a, a classroom that actually will hold 60 students. Um, it'll also work on work with faculty or maybe some of the courses being hybrid. Maybe they meet with the class face-to-face -face on one day and then online another day. Maybe it's A day, B day. They allow 15 of their students of 30 come on Tuesday and then the other 15 on Thursday. And so that is probably the heavier lift of the logistics, but that's what we're working on this week. And going forward, the other thing is, as I indicated before in phase one, we move faculty from face-to-face -face courses into online courses. Well, it's essential that we figure out what the faculty need in order to develop a quality online class. Again, I thank my faculty um, every time, every opportunity I get about their kind of agility to move to remote learning. But I think we all recognize that that's not really what a quality online teaching course is. And so in the fall, it is our intent to make sure that individuals who are teaching online have the training that they need in order to offer a quality online course. And so I initiated an online teaching needs assessment. Again, this instrument came out of that academic reintegration committee. And so that was deployed last week, it closes today. And so then going forward for just two months, which used to seem like a long time, but I'll tell you, it feels like it's two days right now. Um, these are the things that we will be working on. Online training for faculty, remote learning, contingency planning, um, what happens if we have to go back to remote learning on September 30th? How are we gonna actually make that transition? Classroom modifications that I discussed um, initially, and then modification of operations for student support services. How are we gonna do financial aid? How are we gonna do advising? How will the registrar's office operate? And so those are the things that we'll work on over the next two months. Um, I'll shift now to admissions, which of course is on everyone's mind and how this pandemic will affect our admissions for the fall. One of the things that the Board of Governors actually passed was a new admissions policy. They were already scheduled to um, review this admissions policy, I believe in March, um, but it would have been in effect for fall 2021. So they were not thinking initially to put it in effect for fall 2020, 
But of course, due to COVID-19, the Board of Governors took up the admissions policy and ultimately passed it for um, three years. And so I just wanna make sure that the trustees understand the change in the policy. The old admissions policy indicated that students had to have a 2.5 GPA and a 17 SAT or 880, uh, I'm sorry, a 17 ACT or 880 SAT. So before, students had to have both of those. The new policy, however, has it so that students who have a 2.5 GPA or a 19 S ACT or 1010 SAT can be admitted. So this means if a student in theory has a 3.0 GPA and say a 15 on the ACT, they could get admitted. Or in theory, it would say if a student had a 2.0 GPA, but had a 21 on the ACT, they could get admitted. Now, although we know that the new policy allows institutions to admit students under those situations, we realized that we did not just kind of want to open the floodgates. Although that we were given permission, we wanted to make sure we were admitting students who were going to be successful based on the data that we had. And so because of that, we, we had already been part of the MARS pilot, minimum admission requirements pilot study, along with North Carolina Central and Fayetteville State. And so we did a modification of that and those students would have automatically gotten admitted. But students who had um, SAT or GPA out of what we believed were a successful kind of student based on past history, we created a committee to look at those individual applications. And so that's the admissions review committee. It review, reviews students who are outside of the kind of standard rubric that we created. It's a five member panel of faculty and staff, uses ECSU success data as a baseline when they review the applicants. And this committee, because if a student say has a um, 3.0, but they have a low SAT, they wanna start looking to see what, what is bringing their GPA down, or if they have a 275, what's bringing their GPA down? Is it that they are getting all A's in physical education and health classes, but they're not doing well in their English and math, or is it vice versa? Because those types of things you really need to see when you make a decision. You can't necessarily just look at a grade point average when some of those, uh, when they're outside of the rubric. And so that's why this committee meets and they review individual applicants daily. They will actually continue, I mean, I'm sorry, weekly. They actually will continue over the summer. And I will say we have mid admitted um, quite a few students under the modification of the admission standards. And those students are excited and are confirming at a rapid rate. And so I am thankful to the Board of Governors for making that modification. Of course, the SAT and the ACT exams were canceled, which is one of the reasons that they made the modification, because students who may have lower sc scores, they really would not have an opportunity to improve the SAT or ACT scores. And so that was one of the reasons the Board of Governors modified the admission requirements. Um, just a few things on how we are transitioning for admissions, we launched a virtual open house on April 18th because that was the initial day that we were going to have our face-to-face -face open house, and of course, we couldn't have it. We had greetings from the Chancellor, Academic Affairs and Student Affairs, as well as a virtual chat box and information for admitted students. We also are continuing to communicate with students in admissions pros. Um, and then we're also sending out postcards. Here are some examples of some of the postcards we're sending. Also to get them to complete the FAFSA, we know that that is one of the holdups that students often have. And so we are doing the outreach on that, as well as we're doing our virtual orientation. And I believe that um, VC Brown will discuss that. Excuse me, uh, Vice Chancellor. I just want to remind you that we um, have until 1030, and I know you want to leave enough time if there are any questions or comments. Yep, and I'm on my last slide, Chair. Thank you. 
Yeah. Here's my last slide, um, just to give you an update on where we are. And so, as you can see, we're up in every category compared to last year, completed applications, admitted, and confirmed students. And so we are feeling, again, cautiously optimistic. We re recognize that we are unable to really predict how the pandemic will affect our fall enrollment. But based on our data, we are trending above where we would like to be. And that concludes my presentation. Okay, do we have any questions for Dr. Ward? I believe Trustee Barnes has raised his hand. Okay, uh, Trustee Barnes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just like to make a couple of comments. Uh, one is I think you guys have done a tremendous job in, in, in uh, re rising up to uh, deal with this COVID situation and we had not done any real pre-planning in years years but before to, to do that. So I think you've done an excellent job in meeting that uh, challenge. Um, a couple of things though, um, in terms of if we have to, for some reason, go to online learning in the fall, I think the resurgence of the, uh, of the pandemic in the fall, are you, are you confident that we would be able to conduct an entire university educational learning online in a quality way, in the way that you'd, you'd like to see done? So if we, so one, if we have to start, if we have to do 100% online, it will be, a, it's a heavy lift. Um, right now, we are concentrating again on those faculty. We know that out of 110 full-time faculty, 53, 56 now, we know are, are ready. And so our concentration right now is on the other kind of 58, how do we get them to where they need to be? And so that's what this summer is working on. Is working on. I think that the courses that we know would be the most difficult are the science lab courses. How do you do those from A to Z all online? Um, uh, aviation, we wouldn't be able to offer aviation at all if we're online. Uh, of course, how do you kind of fly? Or how do you get into the simulators? So those are the two areas that are concerning to me. The system office is working on getting some resources for the science labs. I think that's probably been a pain point from all the institutions across the system. And so that's one thing that they're working to try to help us deploy um, some of those science courses online. I'll tell you that one of the things that we do know, and it's of course everything here is a, is a, is a balancing game, is that students, particularly freshmen, really want to see what we can do face to face because they want to be on campus. Of course, they ended their career. But uh, I guess to answer your question, um, we would get it done. I think we're doing everything we can this summer and to make sure it's possible. Hopefully, we wouldn't have to do it from day one because what faculty are working is to try to front load all of those kind of hands-on things just in case it happens later on. And so I think that that is um, our hope, of course, we don't know what will happen. Thank you, Provost. I'd like to recognize Trustee Bruce Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. I just had a question, it's really just kind of curious. On the CARES Act student aid, is that a is that a grant program? And are the requirements on the students to use it for certain things, or is it just a financial aid to use as needed? Yes. So the Department of Education, um, you know, came out with they this is this is ever evolving for the Department of Education, but in the end, they said that they let each institution decide exactly how we wanted to actually disperse the money. And so you will see from institution to institution, everyone created their own requirements. And so for us, one, students never have to pay this money back. And even if the student's family would not have received any financial aid, so they completed all the documents, but because of their salaries, they would not have received any money, they still were eligible to receive money for this. And so we will not track, we won't ask them how they're using it. They don't need to tell us. We gave them the funds and they never have to pay it back. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, thank you. I'd like to recognize Chancellor Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to add to Trustee Barnes's question in regards to 100% online. What we have been instructed by the system office at this point, as you've heard, is that we will be on campus in the fall. However, as the provost mentioned, there may be some hybrid type of approaches to students who may have um, special uh, um, accommodations that are necessary. And so we're working through all of that. But in regards to our aviation program, the system office, even in the, even in the spring semester, uh, talked about the importance of the lab piece on some courses, especially in STEM. And so um, they tried to work through some of that by waiving and making exceptions for some students to complete their labs on campus with social distancing and other things. And so I like the provost's um, approach to um, front end some of those lab experiences just in case mid semester we have to go back online. At least we can get some of those uh, contact hours for labs in, which would also include our aviation program. So we're working through that. We're getting guidance from the system office, but of course we want our students to have the best experience, but also um, obtain all the information and all the uh, course requirements that are necessary. But I do want to um, publicly thank our provost, our faculty, our staff. We've been working very, very hard. As you can imagine, uh, this is unforeseen, uh, a situation that we have been put in. And so I'm very thankful to have such a strong team, a strong provost to lead our faculty. And then also the staff and the students' response to this has been very positive and we've been working together. So thank you, Provost. Thank you to your team for all that you all have done, um, faculty, staff, working together to make sure that we transition our students as well as we could. And so for that, I am very thankful. So thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak to that. Thank you, Chancellor. We certainly recognize this Herculean effort. We have uh, two more trustees that would like to speak. First, Trustee Stephanie Johnson. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ward, I'm just so impressed with the extent that just your office went through to help the needy students. Uh, and I thank you for that detailed report. I can't imagine all that you had, had to be done to get to this place, but it gives me some serious Viking pride. So thank you again. Outstanding. Thank you. Shared by all the trustees. And Trustee Kenneth Wilkins, you have the floor. Trustee? Wilkins? Can you hear me? Yes, can. Okay. My question is, Dr. Ward, good report. Uh, I heard that you was on the radio in Greenville the other day, and uh, we appreciate that, Pitt County. But uh, what I want to ask you, if, if there is an uptick that Brother Bond, Trustee Bonds, was talking about with, the, uh, with this virus, that invisible virus, uh, what do you think, I mean, if, if the kids, if, if our children come back on campus, when they come back on campus, what type of uh, procedure do you, I know you got to talk to the chancellor, what type of procedure are we going to do with kids coming, African, a lot of African-American kids all across the country, that where there's been hot spots across the country, if they come on campus, how, how are we going to uh, address that with PP? E, uh, are we going to do testing or what, and to ensure the parents that they're going to be safe when they come on our campus? And I mean, I just want to know some of those steps that's been taken towards that since we have, we, they have selected a date for kids to come back on campus. How are we going to, uh, you know, how are we going to deal with that situation when they come on campus? Absolutely. Um, first, I'm glad you you heard I was on the radio. I'll be back on Thursday. I'm still trying to recruit um, okay. transfer students from Pitt County. So I'm glad that that word has gotten out. Um, yeah. In terms of actually uh, the logistics on how we're going to bring the students back to campus, there is another working group. I didn't discuss it. I believe um, BC Goodson can speak to that. But we have an emergency emergency operations group 
that are really working through the logistics from everything um, on how how many people are going to be on the elevator, <clears throat> how many, you know, how are we going to make sure that there's not a crowd in financial aid? That's one of the issues that we've had at the beginning of the semester. Um, how, when we have a line, how are we going to make sure we keep people six feet apart? Are we going to put things on the floor where our signs are going to come up? And so I'll, I'll turn it over to VC Goodson. I'm not sure if it's in one of his presentations. Yeah, I, I'm going to just suggest that perhaps, uh, 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 Alan, that you wait until student experience as we're running out of time. And we have another trustee that I think may want to make a comment on the provost's presentation. Uh, Trustee Tyne, uh, do you have your hand raised? I do. Thank you. Um, could you just remind me of what our goal is for fall 2020 for confirmed students and what the date is like when we, you know, it's when we finish counting? Yes. And so our fall projection is the, our, uh, floor was 1886. And so, of course, in fall 2019, we had 1772. And so our goal is 1886. And we have an enrollment strategy team that literally meets every Friday at two o'clock that tracks. And so far, so far we are. Again, some of those upticks for pre-registration is. In terms of when we have census date, census is 10 days after the first day of school. And so, of course, we pushed up one week. Um, maybe you all have read that article that we have decided to start school on August the 11th so that students will be out at Thanksgiving and they will not return to campus after that. Um, we are also, of course, suspending their fall break and Labor Day, which we recognize. Again, we're trying to get them here and keep them here so that they're not kind of going back and forth. But 10 days after the first day of school is the census day where we have to report enroll. Thank you. So we uh, recognize that the question on the floor uh, presented by Trustee Kenneth Wilkins is a very big one, and that we're going to roll that over into our student experience and ask your provost between you and your counterparts uh, to answer that. I would like to turn the floor now over to Trustee Lynn Bunch. Okay, um, if we, if there are no other comments without objection, we will stand adjourned. No move. Adjourned. Thank you. I'd now like to turn the floor over to Kim Brown, Chair of the Student Experience. Trustee Brown. Trustee Kim Brown. Good, good morning to everyone. Good morning. Um, I want to call the meeting, um, call the June meeting together of the, um, and let me make sure we're in order. Yes. Once the meeting has been called, okay. As the chair of the committee, I want to remind everyone that we will be con conducting today's meeting pursuant to the new amendments of the Open Meetings Act that apply during states of emergency. The amendment was signed into law and allowed for public bodies to meet via electronic means. The new law does require, however, that we take all votes via roll call, which we will do today. Additionally, pursuant to the amendment to the law, all chats, instant messages, texts, or other written communications between members of the board regarding the transaction of the public business during the remote meeting are deemed a public record. Finally, I will ask all committee members, board members, and participating staff to please identify yourself before participating in deliberations, including making motions, proposing amendments, and raising points of order. As well, I'll read the State Government Ethics Acts for our committee meeting today as chair of the of this committee, it is my responsibility to remind all members of the board of their duty under the State Government Ethics Act to avoid conflicts of interest and appearances of conflict of interest as required by this act. Each member has received the agenda and related information for this board of trustees committee meeting. If any board member knows of any conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any 
matter coming before the Board of Trustees at this meeting, the conflict or appearance of conflict should be identified at this time. If there is none, I will now turn this moment over. Well, before I do that, I just want to kind of apologize for being present and absent. I'm sure everyone on the Zoom knows there's a whole lot going on right now. And um, uh, if I seem, seem, seem a little disconnected, this is my third night without sleep. So mm. between hospital and our society right now, there's just a whole lot. I'm trying to maintain sanity. Um, so when you see me step away, I won't step away during this committee meeting, but when you see me step away, it's because of the mayor and trying to work out some logistics. Um, I did change my background for this, for this committee meeting because of conflicts of interest, um, because my other background kind of takes me back to my, si my 60s revolutionary type <laughs> mentality. So um, I'm doing my best. So thank you all for the opportunity. So with that said, Mr. Brown. Well, before we go there, uh, Trustee, go. And, and, and we thank you very much. We're standing all together, everyone, with locked arms today. But yeah. we do need the roll call before oh, we move exactly to the right. presentation. So that's Gwen, all right. Thank you. Will you call the roll call, please, Ms. Gwynn? Absolutely. Um, student experience. Trustees Kim Brown? Present. Phyllis Fosenworth? Present. <laughs> Jimmy Chambers? Present. Stephanie Johnson? Present. Tracy Swain? Present. Thank Ms. you. Uh, Ms. Gwynn, will you continue for uh, Trustee uh, Brown, approval of the minutes? Yes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the Student Affairs Committee from the March meeting? Yes. Yeah, Is there a second? Second. Okay, and by roll call vote, uh, please um, indicate your approval or not approval. Kim Brown? I approve. Phyllis Bosomworth? Approve. Jimmy Chambers? Approve. Stephanie Johnson? Approve. And Tracy Swain? Approve. Thank you. We are now ready to move forward. All right. I'm sorry. Now, Mr. Brown, we are ready for you. Um, for those of you, hopefully you've received it via email. So I have it on my cell phone so that I can follow along while he takes us through. All right. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Gary Brown, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Uh, thank you, Committee Chair Brown, um, Trustee Chair Robinson, uh, and Chancellor Dixon for the opportunity to provide an update on behalf of the Division of Student Affairs. Um, we are, um, th this presentation uh, will cover four areas, uh, student affairs, COVID-19 response and engagement, uh, some of the preparations that we've been making related to fall of 2020, uh, resource development, uh, and then an update related to our community connections um, 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 series that we launched prior to the pandemic. I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, maybe not go as in depth as my uh, colleague, uh, Provost Ward, uh, but I do wanna uh, kind of clarify that the conversations related to COVID-19 actually began uh, in January, 2020, um, I think across the nation. Um, and very soon after that, there were some conversations that began um, uh, at the behest of the system office uh, they were engaging directors of student health uh, because at that point in time, uh, we were trying to prepare as a system for uh, what could possibly uh, impact our campuses. And no one knew at that time how it would actually do that. Uh, by the end of February, uh, actually during the week of CIAA, our communications and marketing team worked in conjunction with, in conjunction with our student health services department to launch the coronavirus website for the campus. Um, to provide an update. Uh, and very soon after uh, that very next week, um, we formed a small team of individuals within the Division of Student Affairs from Residential Life, Student Health Services, Counseling Services, Student Accessibility Services, which is a department that focuses specifically on offering accommodations for students 
with documented disabilities, as well as the Dean of Students. Uh, and we all began to solidify a plan for re response and support if for some reason a student was infected by the virus. Um, at that point in time, we were still uh, kind of thinking that we would be able to continue on as a campus, but uh, as you can see for the remainder of this table, things were changing very rapidly. Uh, on the next day, we developed and disseminated uh, seven steps for staying healthy based on the CDC guidelines at the time, uh, and then very soon after that, travel restrictions were actually imposed. Um, you know, as the updates came out, again, we continued to inform the campus uh, about what it is they needed to know about COVID-19. Uh, and then we began to consider even what it looked like uh, from an operational standpoint and propo propose some food service guidelines as well as guidelines we were going to be using for the remainder of the semester related to student gatherings. Um, you know, we weren't, we did not uh, end up um, initiating those guidelines, though, uh, because um, that around that same time, the executive cabinet was meeting every day with the chancellor, um, and a decision was made within that body that we would extend spring break to begin the preparation for online learning um, and providing of services from a distance. Um, and in the midst of that, uh, though, uh, we recognized that we had students who were uh, challenged um, in a variety of ways uh, who may have had some extenuating circumstances, uh, whether they be homeless uh, or international or just having a hardship in terms of being able to be away from the campus. Because for all intended purposes, students, when they come to ECSU, it is their home. Uh, and for some of them, uh, there is no place for them truly to return to. So we developed a housing exception process that allowed for students to return after spring break if they had an extenuating circumstance. Uh, and you can see we actually uh, offered about 25 students an opportunity, I'm, I'm sorry, 35 students an opportunity to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, and 25 of those students actually returned uh, to our campus um, after spring break. Um, they did not return, though, without a student health pre-screening uh, that was done, uh, a series of questions that were asked related to kind of whereabouts and interactions. Uh, there were some students who actually had, who completed their application who we were not able to grant uh, exceptions to on the basis that uh, some of those uh, responses were not um, ex acceptable, would not have allowed for us to kind of maintain uh, an environment um, that um, was safe uh, from a health perspective for everyone uh, involved. Um, in the midst of that, during the time frame um, of our spring break, the Student Assistance Fund, which VC Walton shared with you all, we received somewhere in the range of $28,000 uh, through a variety of sources. We are thankful for uh, the benevolence uh, of uh, individuals uh, and corporations, um, um, foundations, and so forth that gave to that effort. Um, and that fund was created to assist students who had um, um, some real challenges, whether it was, you know, loss of job, um, uh, whether it was, um, you know, just a need for, for money. This, these funds actually were granted to us before we actually received the CARES Act funding. Um, and so to date, we've actually extended about $11,000 of, of that $28,000 uh, that we had, um, that we have, have received. Um, on the day um, we began um, return to, to um, instruction um, from a virtual standpoint, we also initiated virtual office hours uh, within student affairs units transitioned uh, to uh, software that would enable us to offer telehealth and telecounseling services uh, to our students from a distance. Uh, you all may have seen some of the wellness tips that were done, and I'm just kind of highlighting because every department really had uh, something that they initiated, but uh, the wellness tips uh, got a fair bit of traction on um, Instagram and Twitter uh, from student health and campus recreation. Um, and then we increased usage in Vikings Engage, um, and, which is the app that we actually shared with you during the last Board of Trustees meeting. Um, and it was very, very helpful for us in terms of communicating with our students in real time. We initiated some um, Instagram Live and Zoom sessions as a mode of connecting with students who 
you know, during this time, it was just important also to, to just be available uh, in the event that a student just wanted to connect. Um, none of us, uh, to be quite honest, have ever lived through this. Um, and so um, to, to meet the need for connection, we initiated those activities. Um, and then students uh, were cleared to return to campus May 11th through the 22nd um, to retrieve items from the residence halls. We did have a, a process for that. Uh, we staggered um, the timeframes the students could come. We ensured um, that they had to, to wear PPE. Um, we limited the amount of individuals who could be in a residence hall at one time. Uh, all of those things were initiated to ensure a safe uh, process uh, of our students being able to retrieve the items that they may not have been able to, to take with them um, when they left for spring break. Uh, because we, we, if you remember, uh, when, we, when they left for spring break, um, initially uh, the thought was that we would extend spring break, they would return to campus, um, and during that time frame of the extended spring break is when, uh, from a system perspective, uh, we all transitioned to the online learning module, which meant that some of our students actually left things in the residence halls and they then needed to return to get them. So um, things have been extremely busy um, over the last several months. Although everyone has worked from a distance, uh, the staff has remained engaged and I wanna thank them publicly um, in front of you for their commitment to ensuring that our students have their needs. Um, the work we do in student affairs is truly vital uh, for that and we could not do a lot of what it is it has been done uh, without their commitment to the effort. In the same vein, um, we have now shifted to begin planning for fall, um, but through implementing uh, social distancing guidelines, um, and we are in the process of developing uh, our, our, what that looks like in a robust fashion. Um, but we also have an obligation as an institution to ensure that we align appropriately with the guidance that comes out from the UNC system. Uh, and so we're, we are updating our plan uh, basically daily at this point in time. Um, and as the guidance comes out, we are updating um, and going back in, making modifications and changing. And so um, certainly, you know, we have some, some things in place and we certainly can kind of talk a little bit about it, uh, but uh, we want to, before we actually truly announce our full process for how it is we'll be welcoming students back, what that looks like, you know, what the move out, move in process looks like, um, what it is that individuals can expect from a PPE perspective, uh, from a testing perspective, those sort of things. We want to ensure that we are uh, in line with what it is that uh, the system uh, um, provides to us as well, uh, because um, our faculty, our staff, and students certainly are asking, um, um, and um, it, that's not lost on the system. Um, but we also, we, we have an obligation as an institution not to just kind of get out there ahead of everything uh, because um, they have some experts there uh, and some, some ties into uh, individuals who are helping to inform that process um, uh, that we are uh, leveraging as a benefit in our planning process. Um, we are, uh, we have talked about, um, you know, in, our move-in process in terms of uh, kind of staggering uh, what that looks like. We are still kind of baking that as well. Uh, and we will share that uh, in the probably coming, uh, coming weeks as to what in particular that truly looks like. But from a new student orientation perspective, and, and because of the fact that our enrollment uh, trends are looking, looking good, we have had to be creative. Uh, and so the team has developed a two-part new student orientation program um, one part of it is actually virtual uh, that will occur through the summer. We've actually already had uh, one online orientation uh, session, and there are some modules that students have to complete. Uh, and then we anticipate that um, as students are returning uh, and our new students are coming to campus, they will come back to campus in time enough for us to initiate the second part of the new student orientation uh, program uh, for them in a face-to-face -face fashion, but taking into consideration all of the things that we've already discussed related to PPE um, and social distancing guidelines and the like. Uh, from a housing and residential life perspective, 
uh, as of Friday. Um, and this is an update uh, to even the, um, the PowerPoint that you might have. We actually are at approximately 85% of our capacity in paid applications and assignments for fall of 2020. We are on pace to be uh, at maximum capacity. Um, and, um, you know, we, we are going to be kind of housing students in the way that we traditionally have uh, as the guidance that has been provided uh, to us from the system allows that um, from a, from a um, perspective of, of, of kind of understanding um, the, um, the guidance that even the CDC has released uh, to college campuses as well. Okay, so I know that there may be questions, um, and um, I can't see you all right now, but um, uh, I will pause let you know, questions. Vice Chancellor Brown, that uh, Trustee Kenneth Wilkins has his hand raised, and I think he'd like to follow up with his initial question. Okay. Trustee Wilkins, you have the floor. Well, I didn't realize my hand was still raised, but... <laughs> Can you follow up on the question I asked earlier about the uh, due to the uh, due to the true, I mean, our students coming back from cross countries, different areas of the United States where, where these upticks have been uh, with this pandemic. And we, we realize that African American kids are mostly, uh, you know, uh, susceptible, and we are mostly susceptible to, to this disease. What, uh, how the parents, uh, how are the parents uh, responding to them coming back on campus and, and you, you're giving them the, the, um, you know, the sense of that everything is going to be, you know, safe with them coming back on campus and what, what are you doing? I know you spoke earlier, you cannot really talk about what you, what your plans are, but I think you know, as trustees, we, we need to know some of the things that you are preparing to keep these kids safe if a, if a uh, uptick break out on campus or something. Yeah, so I can speak uh, kind of in general terms about what we've discussed, uh, and I'll share with you, you know, to date, there has not been this uh, kind of a large outcry from parents who are concerned uh, per se, uh, about their students returning. Well, we do recognize that there are that there there is a fair bit of angst, and I think at this point, parents are kind of waiting to see uh, what it is the institution will produce before they weigh in, if you will, on um, you know um, their considerations. There have been a few emails uh, and the like um, uh, related to that, uh, but we have um, strongly. Um, uh, kind of communicated that, that we are certainly taking the necessary steps and we're being extremely intentional about the planning process. And so, you know, um, Dr. Ward talked a little bit about the EOC group that, that meets, which is uh, actually um, a kind of cross-section of the institution uh, of individuals who have uh, responsibility for working with students face-to-face they provide a level of recommendation um, to the executive cabinet for consideration um, of uh, the uh, practices um, and procedures and prot protocols that uh, they want to be in place. Uh, and then within divisions, um, the provost talked about the committee that she has put together in terms of uh, the um, kind of transitioning back into um, the process, student affairs, we have a, 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 um, a committee that we have developed as well um, uh, to kind of consider some things as well. We have talked um, in great detail uh, about the use of PPE um, and even the institution providing uh, in some way, shape, or form PPE uh, to faculty, staff, and students. Uh, we've talked about social distancing guidelines as it relates to programs and services um, and also um, kind of ensuring that the, the offices um, that um, exist on our campuses that we have um, kind of created uh, the necessary barriers, uh, barriers that um, uh, will be needed to ensure that face-to-face -face service can be provided in a safe fashion uh, to students um, from uh, staff who work uh, here at the institution. Um, additionally, uh, we have... Um, uh, we have discussed, um, which 
gosh, it, it just fell out of my head. But uh, we have we have had um, discussions related to um, if for some reason an outbreak um, arose, we have held a certain uh, number of beds on our campus as quarantine spaces uh, for individuals who um, who may um, be um, may have may kind of test positive for uh, the virus. Um, and uh, are developing a protocol uh, by which uh, communication will happen uh, with uh, with their parents uh, about how it is that they um, um, can um, come and assist their student uh, at at leaving uh, the campus. Uh, we have worked closely with our health department uh, in Elizabeth City um, on protocols um, and related to even contact tracing. Um, and those are the same protocols that are currently in place as well. Um, and so um, uh, we are taking the necessary steps to ensure that, um, you know, if for some reason um, there was an outbreak, that we could uh, respond appropriately. Um, and so those are some of the considerations uh, that have, have gone forward. Um, there are also some, some guidelines being developed related to uh, how um, uh, capacity on on um, uh, engagement spaces, how many students will be allowed to be in um, those spaces during particular time frames, offering programming and services um, in um, some sort of um, uh, modified way. Uh, maybe it's offering programs on our campus in differing locations so we can spread out the number of students uh, who might be engaged, um, and we are considering uh, even uh, conversations on our larger scale events that are typical during the fall semester. And so I know the homecoming committee um, um, ha will be meeting um, to kind of determine some, some next steps. Uh, there likely will be some level of engagement uh, with alums um, and uh, community members as well uh, around to, to garner their input. Um, um, and uh, we're, things are changing so quickly that we have to kind of take it uh, day by day. So hopefully that helps to answer some of your questions related to the considerations, but certainly I can answer uh, any additional questions that you might might have. VC Brown, I thank you. And I, I would like to uh, address Chair Kim Brown, Committee Chair. We have, this is such an important topic. We know you have two presentations, but I... Yes. Uh, We'll definitely uh, make up time at the end. I don't want us to cut off this discussion. I would like you to know, uh, Trustee Brown, that you have uh, Trustee Bosworth and the Chancellor who would like to speak. Okay. I'll recognize Trustee Bosworth. Yes, I, the only thing I wanted to say was thank you to VC Brown and all the staff. I know that you all have been spending many, many hours working on this, and we really appreciate your dedication to the students. And as you said, it's changing daily. And um, uh, I have great faith that you are um, on top of it, and thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Chancellor? Sure, thank you, Chair. Um, I wanna go back to Trustee Wilkins question and, and Trustee Wilkins, it, it's a great question, um, a valid question. Um, as VC um, Brown did describe, we have been working very diligently. We have a comprehensive plan, um, but we're also waiting for um, guidance from the system office to kind of sign off on what we're proposing. And we have a meeting with the system office on June 8th go over our plan and the effort there is just to make sure that the campuses have a unified approach and so all of what you have mentioned as far as questions being asked consideration of preparation all of that's going to be solidified in the next couple of weeks and we will be going public with our plan once we get the approval at the system level thank you and we have uh attorney goodson with his hand raised attorney goodson yeah, I did just want to note some actions that uh, the chancellor has already sort of taken um, so far. And, and one has been around, you know, ensuring that the campus has the PPE that we need and the cleaning materials that we need. And um, she's put a charge under us to go to the market and make sure that we procure what we need for the year. And we're able to do that 
um, were able to do that with some of the funding that came down, um, some of the funding that we received from our federal and state partners. Um, the other thing is also taken the, um, she's also um, put in place uh, more money for temporary housekeepers. So when we look at one of the things the CDC guidelines puts out is, you know, you have to continue to make sure you hit those high touch areas. Uh, we are already in the process of onboarding, doubling, more than doubling our housekeeping staff so that we can make sure we keep um, spaces adequately clean, high touch point areas adequately clean. And then the guidance that came down from the CDC, uh, we are sending to our housekeeping staff for training as they have guidance related to how we, how you should clean um, and the things that you should consider during this pandemic. So uh, in addition to, you know, the plan that is, that is currently being put together, um, we've already under, we've already started procuring some of the materials that we need to be ready for fall and the people as well. And um, I know that one thing that I don't know if you all have had an opportunity to see, but there's a question around liability and what protections are out there related to the same. Um, the, the state government put out limited liability protections for educational institutions um, that um, essentially makes us immune from suit for, from, a, from a student who may, ha who may um, catch COVID as a result of being in our environment. And not only did that for higher ed institutions, but they did it for private, um, private businesses as well. Um, so that legislation has already passed. Um, as Gary mentioned, there's a number of, of different working groups that are happening at the system office. I know that I'm on one for um, that we actually meet tomorrow, but we're, we're looking at how do we notify students of, of some of those things that come down uh, related to um, reimbursements, related to um, liability protection, so on and so forth. So uh, this, as the chancellor mentioned, you know, all of these things are gonna fold itself into the plan and um, once the system once the system as a collective comes together on some of these issues, uh, we'll be more ready to issue guidance. I did just want to make uh, make you all aware of those things. Thank you, Trustee Kim Brown. You have the floor. I um, want to make sure first of all that VC Gary Gary Brown is finished. Um, there's a couple more slides on your presentation. Right, um, and so I will just kind of speed through those um, so that George has some time to kind of talk about. Well, we also that. got Trustee Jimmy. Okay. You want me to take it? Uh, no, you can finish. Okay, finish, sir, okay. please. All right, so Title IX, um, there, in the midst of everything, uh, there was um, a policy revision. Um, there was a policy revision um, <clears throat> down from the U.S. Department of Education related to Title IX. There are some very substantive changes to the policy. Um, and so we're working through what those look like. You can see them listed there. Uh, they have to be effective by August um, of 2020. Uh, and so I just wanted to bring that to your attention because it will uh, create a level of change for us in terms of how we do business from a Title IX perspective. And there are also some implications to our student code of conduct as well uh, and some updates that will be made related to how we address Title IX related issues on our campus. Uh, from a resource development standpoint, there's a list uh, before you of the grant proposals that have been submitted uh, by the division uh, to date. Uh, we uh, are very pleased to have been awarded since our last uh, meeting uh, two awards, one from the UNC system, well, both from the UNC system, one for a collegiate recovery uh, community, uh, which focuses ar around uh, alcohol and drug awareness on our campus, uh, and then also um, another mini grant that enabled us to kind of move forward with the telehealth um, services that we talked about before. We do have a very large kind of grant proposal that is currently with the Golden Leaf Foundation uh, and things sound um, fairly promising related to that. We've had now two conversations with them uh, since the time of our proposal, uh, and they will be making some final decisions on that grant this week. Uh, and so we just wanted to bring you some update on that. Uh, and then finally, from the Community Connections uh, Performance and Lecture Series, um, again, we are, are thankful for uh, the gift that was made by Trustee Bosworth to initiate this activity. Uh, we actually had a capacity crowd 
on March the 10th. Uh, this was right before everything kind of shifted for us. Uh, the feedback was extremely positive uh, and the committee has uh, been meeting. Uh, certainly it will be impacted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of how it is that it looks for this, uh, at least for the fall semester. Uh, but we have a great start that we have uh, been able to initiate. So thank you so much for the time um, and sharing with you what's been going on in student affairs. All right, any additional questions for VC Gary Brown? If not, we will move to um, trustee Jimmy, please. Welcome, sir. Yes, sir, thank you. All right, uh, let's see, it is good morning. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jimmy Chambers Jr. and I'll be serving as the student body president for the 2020-2021 academic year. A little bit more about myself. I am a rising junior, criminal justice and homeland student from Indian Trail, North Carolina. For those of you who may not know where Indian Trail is, it is located 20 to 30 minutes south of Charlotte, North Carolina. And this year, Executive Cabinet will feature Tatiana Keo, who will be serving as Vice President of Internal Affairs, Shania Moore, who will be serving as Vice President of External Affairs, Pele Ranking, who will be serving as Vice President of Finance, Angel Ostadon, who will be serving as Attorney General, Jalen Dow, who will be serving as Recording Secretary, and Jalen Webb, who will be serving as Corresponding Secretary. Um, a little bit more about Student Government Association. It came to the campus of Elizabeth City State University in 1953 after students' unrest decisions after a popular student athlete was actually uh, dismissed from the football team um, after the administration made that decision. Um, it was created to produce student-derived solutions, um, also to enhance the total student experience and to protect student rights. Um, the three key uh, points of student government is uh, governance, advocacy, and action. And to talk about uh, a little bit more of my plans for this year, um, for amplifying the student voice, um, I plan to have a very strong student senate that will have four standing committees that is that will be academic affairs, student safety, uh, campus services, as well as student affairs. Um, they will also be in charge of producing legislation to get things passed and making sure the students are happy. Um, when it comes to activism, I want to make sure our students' voices are heard in the community, um, such as making sure that students are voting, uh, especially with the presidential election coming up. Uh, one thing that I did this past year was, along with other student leaders, was to make sure students were getting registered to vote. Uh, so that was a very, very successful thing. Uh, when it comes to inclusion, um, I want to welcome all student voices uh, to um, and definitely create the next pipeline of student leadership and student leaders that will continue and to improve the student um, experience on the campus, um, as well as create um, a strategic plan to make sure that even with the new uh, COVID-19 restrictions that we will have, the student morale will continue to be high as it is now. And before I go to questions, I do wanna highlight one thing. Um, the seal that you see there was actually created by one of our students who is a graphic design student. And when he presented me with the different concepts, um, it took me at least 30 minutes to an hour just to pick one because he did such an outstanding job. And our students have so much talents and I really want to showcase that this year. And now we can go to questions if anyone has any. Before we go to questions, oh, yeah, before we go to questions, one of the things I wanna, um, commend you on, sir, is the diversity of your cabinet, especially in a season like this. I know, you know, some of that is not all your choice, but but that that was, that's something that I think we got to take the advantage of marketing. So the more you can display the portrait of all of those young adults that are serving the university student body, um, we just need in this season that kind of positive um, expression of who we are. So yes, thank they you. 
Yes, sir. They are all hardworking individuals. I'm glad to have them on my cabinet as well. Any questions for um, President Chambers? I don't see any new hands raised. I will remind Attorney Goodson, Chancellor, and Trustee Wilkins, your hands are still showing. Unless you have a question, I will... I just would like to say, uh, okay. Madam Chair, that I, to uh, Trustee, Trustee Jim and Chambers, that we look forward to working with him on this on the board on the board this year, and he seemed like an exceptional young man, and we uh, and uh, one day be an attorney. So <laughs> we look forward to working with him. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, Trustee Wilkins. We all agree. Looking forward to working with you, Jimmy. Thank yes. you. All right, Madam Chair, I think we are now ready to go to um, Mr. George Bright, VC jo Af Athletic Director George Bright's presentation. And good morning. Good morning. Trustee and Committee Chair Brown, thank you, uh, Chairman Robinson, and of course, Chancellor Dixon and Board of Trustees members and all in attendance. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm George Bright, your Director of Athletics, and thank you again for this opportunity to present to you on behalf of the Department of Athletics. Today's update from the Athletics Department will consist of an intro of our new athletic staff, an update on the academic performance of our student athletes, what's happening with COVID-19 as it relates to the preparation for fall for athletics, and of course, a little progress review on our football field project at Roebuck Stadium. So our new, newest athletic staff member is Tynesha Lewis. You might have read uh, about her success with us. Uh, drafted again in the uh, 21st overall pick of the 2001 draft. She played six professional seasons in the WNBA. Uh, she is from Macclesfield, North Carolina. Graduated from North Carolina State with a Bachelor of Arts degree in chemistry a Bachelor of Science degree in Bioscience. She has a master's degree from AIU in Business Administration Marketing and a second master's degree from Grand Canyon University in Education Curriculum. She has a collegiate coaching experience uh, listing as an assistant coach with Illinois State University and most recently, of course, at North Carolina Central. You know, I'm very confident that we have the right coach at the right time to lead the Mighty Vikings women's basketball program now and into the future. So. Just want to reintroduce to some and introduce to the others our new women's basketball head coach, Tanisha Lewis. And just a quick acknowledgement to the search committee uh, and, of course, Chair Associate AD Jarrell Drew for all the hard work that they did in emerging a terrific candidate for ECSU. Today is uh, Tanisha Lewis's actual first day. She's here in the building and uh, ready to get started. So welcome to Coach Lewis. like to also bring everyone up to speed as to what's happening with the academic performance of our student athletes. Again, you, you're familiar with our student athlete retention rate, and I, it's, it's so high that I have to say it all the time. It's a 91.6 rate, which is the highest in the CIAA. Uh, for this spring, we've had 77 student athletes earn above a 3.0 GPA which is again a 26% increase compared to this time last year. We've had 49 student athletes achieve Viking student athlete status, which that is, um, you have, there's a team gray, a team white, and a team blue that you'll see in just a moment, and each of them achieve their specific status that's there. We've had a, uh, which is again a 36% increase compared to last year. We have um, several students uh, that are doing well. We've had 20 different majors represented by our student athletes. The number of student athletes in the uh, ECSU Honors Program is six. We've had three student athletes who are Benjamin Gilman International Scholars, and of course, two student athletes that have a perfect 4.0. And of course, we've had uh, two teams that have had a 3.38 tie, if you will. Uh, the women's tennis and the women's volleyball programs have the highest team GPAs uh, for the spring 2020. So that's where we are with our academic performance right now. I'd like to take us into the what's happening with COVID in terms of athletics. And just before you is a, is a high level summary of what kind of happened in, you know, at, as we were in our CIAA basketball tournament, as BC Brown talked about, and then what kind of happened the next week or so. 
So just a, just as a brief overline, like we were one of the fortunate uh, conferences to have their tournament actually completed. Many did not have that result. We were the one of the few that had their basketball tournament completed. So after we completed ours, hours, we ran into that next week or so with the Ivy League starting this whole process of canceling its tournament. To me, that's key in this process. The Ivy League started on March 10th, and then you started to see all of these uh, statements coming from the uh, NCAA on limited attendance, uh, meaning nobody in the gym or very few people in the gym when these tournaments or championships were being played. That same date, we canceled our CIAA softball roundup, which we were to host here in Elizabeth City. Then the same, right after that, the NBA suspended its season, and many other things happened on March 11th. And then March 12th, the MEAC canceled its basketball tournament. Right in the middle of the tournament, they stopped it. You also see that a lot of the Division I levels, the uh, Power Five leagues, the ACC, Big East, Pac-12, they all halted their basketball tournaments right around March 12th. We then canceled our spring sports season on March 12th. And then the NCAA canceled all of its basketball tournament and remaining winter and spring championships. The CIAA suspended its spring competition. Excuse me. And, of course, in the next day, the NCAA suspends uh, recruiting, and, and a lot of things happened. Uh, they did that until April and then continued it a little bit later. The Olympics canceled uh, their, or post postponed, excuse me, the Olympics from 2020 to 2021. And, of course, the NCAA extended its dead period to May 31st. So I say that to let you know that, the, of course, the sports landscape, landscape you know, altered significantly. You know, from playing games behind closed doors to canceling NCAA events and, and putting professional leagues on temporary suspension. I mean, we looked at this abbreviated timeline because of the, the corona, uh, coronavirus. <laughs> and, and really, there are still more questions than answers that we have in terms of athletics at this time. Just last week, Division I Council voted to lift the moratorium on athletic activities actually starting today. So... They're clearing the way for voluntary workouts and training to, dang it, to begin at some of the team facilities, and institutions are taking their time to pace as to how that will happen. So at the CIAA level, as of May 12th, there was some, there's some information that they shared with us, and I won't read it to you. It's on your screen, and you have that in your printout. But some key points there are just that the baseline is to be established, excuse me, uh, and that the baseline in establishing a plan <clears throat> for resumption of, of athletic scheduling, practice, travel, competition, and championships is something that can come to us from the CIAA, from national and state mandates. And that resumption of athletic competition is driven by, driven by a, bunch of state, a bunch of different measured approaches, okay? So there will be a tremendous amount that has to happen before we can actually get back to athletic competition. We're taking a look at budgets, travel mandates, and that, and to keep the quality of the student athlete experience uh, where it is. But those are those are the things that we are considering at the CIAA level. And of course, there'll be detailed plans established from our healthcare providers and our trainers uh, moving forward accordingly. You know, and other considerations that have been talked about at the CIAA, CIAA level is that it may be necessary for all staff and student athletes to be required to be tested for COVID-19, you know, prior to or, or as we approach an athletic competition and practice. I mean, we can anticipate that even with that testing, there will be some COVID-19 positive results after we start up in the fall. So safety, tracing, and communication protocols are all in place and how we'll deal with those and con how we need to inform people that are in contact with individuals who test positive. You know, state and local authorities will also have control over the startup of public events. So we, not only is it our decision, but it is a decision by the state, the UNC system, and others about uh, the control of the public event. And, of course, non-conference schedule, scheduling, uh, athletic scheduling may be limited to regional opponents for fall sports and maybe even as we uh, move into and progress into uh, the rest of the season to diminish the threat and its intensity. So our action plan to return has some procurement considerations. B.C. Goodson talked about some of that, but we plan on disinfecting and getting those supplies to do that 
uh, our physical distancing constraints and making sure we're talking about our seats and our restrooms and all those gathering points, how we separate people, how we uh, initiate uh, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, what that looks like, who has it, is it everybody, how we can initiate plexiglass bar barriers and shields, health screenings, and our mobile ticketing concept. If we can do things with a non-touch approach in terms of ticketing, that's what we're looking to be able to do. In our return to action game plan, there's some facility timeline things that I've established. And again, these things are can be fluid. Uh, three weeks prior to our student athletes returning, again, we'll you know take a look at the schedules and staffing schedules two, a couple weeks before, making sure that we're deep cleaning practice facilities, equipment, uh, signage, making sure that that's all appropriate. One week prior to student athletes returning, making sure we're disinfecting and have the, the facilities prepared and, and continue with ongoing and cleaning and disinfecting. Then, of course, a couple weeks prior to hosting a competition, taking a look at Roebuck and Vaughn and making sure we've got a deep cleaning process with seats and restrooms and signage, making sure all safety protocols are there for not just us, but our visiting teams as well. One, te one week prior to hosting a competition, Again, trying to re-disinfect, uh, make sure that our competition facilities are ready. And then, of course, we'll be doing walkthroughs of those procedures. And then on game day, we'll continue to clean after the, the event has happened with ongoing cleaning and planning and preparation for basketball and other winter sports. So let me, let me take a quick pause, if that's okay, Trustee Brown, to entertain any questions that might uh, happen in occurrence to athletics. Just want to let uh, folks know that we, we do plan to test our athletes and coaches and staff and, and follow elevated safety protocols for tracing and treatment and certainly implement social distancing as the science and the data dictates to us. And, in, and of course, we'll be in consistency with our federal and state UNC system and local public health guidelines. You know, we do plan to return to football we do plan for a return of football in early August and that date and time may dictate, you know, that the athletes returning to campus will certainly be tested for COVID-19 and possibly quarantined before even beginning activities. We'll, we'll let the science and data tell us that. And that decision will come from the medical professionals that we have. Again, there's still more questions and answers that we have at this time, but can I pause uh, Trustee Brown to entertain any questions that might be related to COVID and athletics? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I think, you know, uh, two things. Um, I've heard this said a lot during the um, presentation. In the case of a spike in COVID, um, my word is I get a report every morning. Mm -hmm. We might as well change that to when there is a spike because, yes. you know, that's going to happen. Um, so, I will be jumping up and down if it does not in any way, shape, or form in any of the areas of our society and our community. But I think the expectation is that is probably going to happen. Second thing is, before we open it all the way up for questions, can you speak to um, A.D. Bright, the potential regulations that the NCAA might have for eligibility for young people who who this year their their season was suspended? Well, the NCAA is allowing a waiver for those that had missed their season due to the spring sports uh, cancellations. Again, they were they are to work through our compliance offices or any compliance office uh, to retain or obtain that additional year. Again, it's not it, it's not it is it can be a simple process if they complete the waiver. Uh, but again, it starts with our compliance office and then initiating that. Each is a case-by-case -case basis, I can tell you that, uh, Trustee, Trustee Brown, but again, it, it requires a waiver for us to begin the process. Any questions for um, our AD? It is 1126, so although the chair gave us some time, additional time, I don't want to be a bad steward of it, so. <laughs> Is it okay if I can just flip through just a few photos? Yeah, I do want us to see the Roebuck stuff. Okay. So that, that's valuable. So if the chair can give So us if we started with this uh, drone shot in February, that's what it looked like in February. We started and initiated the Reimagine Roebuck campaign 
we're all familiar with that. And we started to begin with some of the construction processes uh, in, in March and around that time. So just a few photos for you. At the, the very top left, you can see them starting to take off all the degraded uh, grass and areas that were there, some of the dirt. On the top right, you can see uh, just that penetration continuing to remove uh, those elements. Bottom left, you can see though the, the construction folks, they are removing that turf. Then the, the bottom right, you'll see just, you know, again, all the old dirt, new dirt applied, smoothed out, a significant amount of dirt applied back to the field, new clean fill uh, at that point. Top left, you can see them again, uh, just uh, getting that dirt created onto the field. Uh, you can see the process there. Uh, the bottom right, just for the sake of time, starting to create and fix the irrigation system that we currently have. So uh, they, they did that. Uh, we have a new well that's there to help control some of our, our water flow and, and make sure that the field is operating at its peak. We then uh, started to do the new sod installation top left. You can see some of that. Uh, you can see the continuance of that on the top right. And then the, the bottom kind of shows that installation of the sod right there. I can tell you right now that the, the grass looks terrific and we're continuing in the process right now, letting that grow, knit and heal. And as soon as we, we're ready to do that, I'll be able to share that finished project uh, product with you pretty soon. Any questions to me regarding the Reimagine Roebuck campaign? Just a quick shout out to um, uh, Vice Chancellor Walton and thanking her for working this through in terms of the the fundraising efforts that we recently had. Thank you, Chancellor Dixon, for the vision to help get this thing moving. And I think we're hopefully we'll have an opportunity to see a finished product in the fall. Outstanding. Any questions for um, A.D. Bright? If not, um, I believe we're ready to, you have something, Chair Robinson? Nope, you're on. I mm -hmm. believe we're ready to um, have a roll call vote and a motion for adjournment. Ms. Gwen, you're still muted. I, I, I don't think you need a roll call. I think you can simply say without objection, we stand okay. adjourned. Is that correct, correct. Gwen? That is correct. Okay. So if there are no vocal objections, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Uh, Trustee Harold Barnes, if you are available, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Good morning. This is Trustee Harold Barnes, Chairman of the Infrastructure and Technology Committee. I'd like to call that committee to order at this time. As chair of the committee, I want to remind everyone that we will be conducting today's meeting pursuant to the new amendments to the Open Meetings Act that applied during states of emergency. The amendment was signed into, into law and allow for public bodies to meet via electronic means. The new law does require, however, that we take all votes via roll call, which we will do today. Additionally, pursuant to the amendments to the law, all chats, instant messages, texts, or other written communications between members of the board regarding the transactions of the public business during the remote meeting are deemed a public record. Finally, I will ask all committee members, board members, and participating staff to please identify yourself before participating in deliberations, including making motions, proposing amendments, and raising points of order. With respect to the, government's, the State Government Ethics Act, as chair of the Infrastructure and Technology Committee, it is my responsibility remind all members of the board of their duty under the state government's ethics act to avoid conflicts of interest and appear appearance of conflicts of interest uh, as required by this act each member has received the agenda and related information for this board of trustees committee meeting if any board member knows of any conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any matter coming before the board of trustees at this meeting 
the conflict or appearance of conflict should be identified at this time. Hearing none, I will call for a roll call. Madam uh, Sanders. Thank you. Infrastructure and Technology, Trustees Harold Barnes. Present. Phyllis Bosomworth. Present. Bruce Brown. Present. Jimmy Chambers. Present. Tracy Swain. Present. And Kenneth Wilkins. Present. Thank you. Form, and so we'll move on. Uh, at this time, I'll ask for motions for approval of the minutes of the March 10th, 2020 meeting. Kenneth Wilkins would like to make a motion to approve the minutes of our March meeting. Is there a second? Bruce, Brown, second. Is it Bruce that made the second? Sorry, sir. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'll have a roll call vote for approval of minutes. Certainly. For approval of minutes, Harold Barnes. Aye. Phyllis Bosomworth. Approved. Bruce Brown. Approved. Jimmy Chambers. Approved. Tracy Swain. Approved. Kenneth Wilkins. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the infrastructure update for Mr. Harley Grimes, uh, Interim Director, Facilities and Planning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Before I get started, I would like to say that most of the activities that are going on on campus in construction, that all the contractors are working to meet the requirements for social distancing. The With Moore Hall and GR Little Library, that uh, those activities are on, on schedule per the contractors. And just for this committee to be aware, we are meeting weekly with the contractors uh, the, and the designers to review any questions that may come up uh, that are being recognized in the meeting that we have with State Construction. Sorry. So the, as you can see on the timeline that we are still on schedule, as I, I said, uh, September the 20th, we are, I'm sorry, September of 2020, we are looking for the reopening of GR Little Library and with the spring 2021, the reopening of Moore Hall. Going ahead to our USDA projects with Bias Hall, the work is ongoing for the demolition and build back on the internal parts. Uh, if you drive by, you will see there's a lot of activity going on on the outside. And then also I want to note that with Heath Hill and Doles, we were able to get that demolition included in the project. So as we're looking at the timeline, you will see that uh, this month we are looking to begin the demolition of UKL and Doles. Uh, the contractor is finalizing the disconnects of the utilities and we will be letting uh, administration know when that uh, day is going to begin. We're still looking at the fall of 2020 for Bias Hall reopening. Our Hurricane Dorian recovery bill, that uh, these are the buildings that have been identified as part of the $5.2 million. And with the help of uh, Trustee Barnes, we were able to um, identify a designer selected uh, 
to for negotiations with state construction. We are looking for the hub and the contractor advertisement to take place in the summer of 2020. The drawings being submitted for SEO approval and fall uh, of 2020 beginning construction. We also have 800 ton chiller that we are looking to get designed. And again, with uh, Trusty Barnes participation, we were able to identify a design firm that uh, is going to be negotiating with state construction for the fee. And we will have those design documents. Uh, we're planning on this month having those for SEO review. And then at that point, we will see where we are. Our Bedell cafeteria, we had an emergency declaration that uh, we've gone through. We, we identified a firm to design it. We've gone through state construction, approval on the documents, and we are in the process of bidding. Those bids will be open opening up uh, later this week. And we are looking to have summer construction pending no issues with supply chain delivery and, uh, and interfering with our opening in, in August. Also, uh, we have some action items and this is for the, uh, the board to review for the Hurricane Dorian repairs designer selection. JKF was the architecture firm that was selected by the review committee. We also had uh, NV5 selected by the review committee for the 800 ton chiller. Um, so as a, a point of policy, uh, the board needs to uh, address that. Mr. Grant, we also go ahead, let me uh, go ahead and take these uh, under eight first and go ahead and get those uh, uh, reviewed and approved uh, before you move further. Sure. Um, I'd just like to simply say that um, I did participate uh, in these uh, interviews of the various uh, candidates, and we had several candidates for each of these areas, and I do believe that the, that the uh, committee did uh, choose the best of each group. Uh, so at this time, I would entertain a motion for the approval of the Hurricane Dorian repair project uh, with the selection of JKF architecture uh, to uh, do that job. Is there a motion? A question first, Chairman. Yes. Okay. Uh, who who was on the review committee? Because I see it says selected by review committee. Didn't didn't I didn't have any correspondence of you know concerning you know that there was a review on these different items. Could you somewhat give me an update? Uh, yes, Mr. Grimes, do you have the list of the, the names of the persons on the committee? Yes, I do. We had uh, Melanie Baker, who's our hub coordinator. We had Dennis Leary, who is our facilities director. We have Michael Williams, who's the associate facilities director. Uh, myself, uh, Robert Griffin, who is the campus architect. And then we also had uh, Dan Young uh, as part of the committee. <clears throat> So uh, just, this is just a request in the future. Mr. Grimes, could you notify the uh, committee members when, di when, you, uh, when, you, when these things are going on so that if we have the opportunity to attend, we will? Yes, sir, we'll do that. Now, I would like to make the motion uh, to uh, accept that uh, Hurricane Dorian repairs. Trustee Kenneth Wilkins. Is there a second? A second, Bruce Brown. Uh, is there, are, are there any other discussion? Is there any other discussion? If not, uh, it's been moved and proper second. Uh, all in favor, let it be known by, no, excuse me, uh, Madam Secretary, would you call the roll? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the um, first approval. Um, Trustee Barnes? Aye. Trustee Bosenworth? Approved. Trustee Bruce Brown? Approved. Trustee Jimmy Chambers? Approved. Trustee Tracy Swain? Approved. Uh, Trustee Kenneth Wilkins, who made the motion. 
Thank you. Did Mr. Wilkins vote? Yeah, I said approve. Yes, he actually, he did. Mm -hmm. He made the motion. Thank you. Um, next uh, item will be the 800 ton chiller. NV5 was chosen as the, the person to do that project. Um, can we get a motion for approval on that as well? This is Stephanie. Yes, Go ahead, go ahead, Phyllis. This is Phyllis. Um, I make a motion that we approve the 1,800 the 18, ton chiller with MV5. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, this is Jimmy Chambers, and I second that motion. Thank you very much. Any discussion? If not, we'll ask for a call to roll. Roll call for this vote. Harold Barnes. Aye. Phyllis Bosenworth. Approved. Bruce Brown. Approved. Jimmy Chambers. Approved. Tracy Swain. Approved. And Kenneth Wilkins. Approved. Thank you. Thank you very much for the vote. And we'll go to item B now of the Harrington Road demolition. Yes, the Harrington House demolition is located on the corner of Harrington and Weeksville Road. It is, it is the white two-story structure that it is identified in all of the campus documents as residence number 108, which is vacant. And so the in looking through historical documents, we can find discussion to demolish this, uh, this structure, but we were unable to locate identification that the board had approved uh, the demolition. And so that is an item that uh, we would like to bring before the board at this time. Any questions? If not, uh, is it, this is Phyllis Bosenworth. Um, is the house being used in any way at the moment? And when was the last time it was occupied? The house currently has, uh, is being used as storage of obsolete uh, furniture and equipment uh, that has not been uh, used in, I would say, at least a decade. Uh, I do not have the exact dates of when that building was uh, was taken out of service. I have a follow-up question. Sure. Could that house be used for income? If it's, uh, I mean, what is the status of the house? Because I see the house is a nice structure. So what is the... Uh, reason we are not using it for some income other than storage. Well, the interior of the structure has a lot of environmental damage that would have to be addressed. Plus, uh, in looking at uh, trying to have uh, or, or use that as a rental income, there's a lot of work that would have to be done to, uh, to use that location. Okay, so, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm like Phyllis, you know, I just want to know what's the, you know, is it, is it the value of the house? Is it, with, uh, what's the value of that home? Is it w worth putting some money into that home versus, because you got to spend money either way you do it. You got to demo it. And what would be the cost to do some work on the inside of the home to get it livable versus demolition? Can I, can I jump in here, Harley? Yes. Part? Um, so you know, we so we evaluated the. I mean, the cost to get the bit to get the the house up to up to snuff is is going to be at least two to three times more than it would cost to demolish it. Um, the the other challenge, as Harley mentioned, is this this house has a number of environmental issues to include asbestos. Um, so we're trying to we're going to have to as a part of our demolition plan, we're going to have to manage that concern as well. I think the other thing to keep in mind is where this house is. Um, so this house currently sits beside the main sign for campus. So when you come on the campus, the first thing you see to some degree is, is a house. I don't know that um, we would, that is a space that we would want to use to rent to private, um, rent to a private person kind of directly behind our, our main, um, main sign. And I mean, in terms of um, Trustee Bosenworth's question, I've been here for at least eight years. There hasn't been anybody in there 
occupying that home, I know for at least that time period, I would imagine um, you're at least probably talking 10, 15 years since someone has been in there or somewhere around that. So I think what we try to do before we knock down the building is try to do a cost benefit analysis. Um, and, you know, what would it cost to get the building up to snuff? Is this a building that, um, you know, from an old house standpoint, is this a building that we would want to rent to the market or keep in our Rolodex to rent to a faculty member or, or someone, um, someone similar? And I think the, you know, the decision that we kind of came to, a, or at least our thought process around that was the cost to get that building up to snuff would be, be too much. Where the building sits is not really what we want people to see when they first um, come to campus. And then two, you know, um, how do we continue to maintain and manage the environmental issues um, that are within the building? So that that kind of, all of those things sort of, um, put together informed our decision-making process around uh, the approval that we're asking to demolish the building today. And in terms of other space, I know you mentioned some other space. We also have three other houses on campus, uh, four other houses, I think, on campus that we use, um, a little off campus rather, that we use for faculty member that may be transitioning to the campus or any staff member that may be transitioning to the campus need some temporary housing or any potential head coach that may be transitioning to the campus. So that was also a factor. Do, do we even have the space, other spaces on campus where we could transition someone in as they're new to the environment? And the answer to that question is yes, we have four, four rental houses on Weeksville Road to do that. So, you know, thinking about all those things together, that sort of informed our decision-making process around asking the board for approval to demolish this home. I, I too asked those kinds of questions earlier on uh, to one was whether or not the building had any historical significance. Uh, and the answer to that question was no. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, if we were going to keep it, then we would all have to probably move it to another location because it is, it is inconsistent with the current architecture that is in the uh, And so I was told the same thing, that um, the cost-benefit analysis would be that it would be much more uh, expensive to do the repairs than it would be to uh, demolish the building, and it had no good. So, um, but again, this I is this is Phyllis. Uh, I have uh, one other question. Um, how how big is the lot that the house sits on? And um, I missed what you said you plan to do with the lot once the house was gone. At this point, we're looking at keeping it as green space. The, uh, the lot itself was absorbed into the campus acreage. And so there are no definitive uh, lines as to the plot itself. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I believe that a motion on the floor, I did do. No, I don't. No, sir. That. No, we, we still need a motion and a second. Thank you. Can we get a motion to approve? Bruce Brown, I'll make the motion to uh, approve the demolition of Harrington House Resident 108. Is there a second? Price is Swain second. Any further discussion? If not, let's call the roll. Okay, roll call for this vote. Yes. Barnes? Aye. Phyllis Bosomworth? Approved. Bruce Brown? Approved. Jimmy Chambers? Approved. Tracy Swain? Approved. And Kenneth Wilkins? Aye. Thank you. All approved. Motion carried. Uh, Mr. Counselor, is there any reason why we could not take these uh, three lease agreements together or should we take them separately? So, so Harley's going to talk about the leases. We're not, um, we're not going to um, ask, we don't, we're not going to ask for approval. I think Harley wants to talk through the strategy related to how we intend to lease these, um, how we intend to lease these uh, properties uh, moving forward. Um, so Harley, did you want to take that on? Yes, we wanted to bring the, the topic of the leases to the board's attention 
we are looking into a market analysis to ensure that the current lease amounts for the listed uh, properties are adequate to cover things like maintenance and repair. We may bring this back to the board if we discover there is an increase required uh, approval by policy. So we just, again, to uh, let the board know of what we're looking into, especially with uh, some leases expiring and uh, and the potential for renewals. Yeah, and to give a little bit more on that background. Um, so for example, we, we have traditionally leased farmland um, 35 acres out, we want to do a sort of a real deep dive and cost benefit analysis to um, the amount of money that we charge for that lease, which is typically very, very low in terms of market. Um, so that may result in us having to come back to the board for some approval. Uh, we currently lease out a, a, a small space to house CenturyLink's infrastructure in one of our um, dormitories. Uh, we want to look and see what the value of that um, take a second look at what the market value of, of that space is in terms of what they are using it for. And then as I mentioned earlier, we have about four rental houses that sit on Weeksville Road. Uh, these rental houses range anywhere between two to three bedroom uh, rental houses. They're, they are certainly good as transitional homes. One of the challenges that we've had with these houses is we haven't rented them out to be able to cover some of the repairs at a price to be able to cover some of the repairs that are, are recurring in these houses. For example, when somebody moves in, we usually have to do some level of work, whether it's painting or, um, you know, putting in new carpet or whatever the case may be. Um, so we're going to look at those rental houses in terms of market. Um, we want it to be competitive, but we also have to, it needs to be sustainable um, and it's not sustainable at this point. So those things may, if they cross the threshold, um, those are items that may come back before the board for your approval. Tell us, Sponsor Morth here, uh, do you know what you're renting the farmland for and the houses? Do you have that information? Yes, we do have that. Uh, the farmland we are renting for $7,000 um, $7, and some change per year. And then the houses are being rented for $800 a month. Okay, thank you. So a uh, question on the 35 acres. What, what's being raised on that now? Do you know how? Uh, we do not know the specific uh, pr uh, crop that they're, they're raising. We do know that that has been a three-year lease that is uh, going to be expiring July the 18th. Yeah, the reason I asked that, I know a lot of farmers now are renting land for hemp and uh, was those high high end crops, and if if we are if we are leasing the property at thirty five acres at uh, seven thousand, yeah, I, I haven't divided that up to see how much that is per acre. You probably would know. I know you probably did the calculations on it. how much is it per acre. You know, um, I'm, I'm two hundred, two hundred dollars. Yeah, so okay. we probably yeah, so. If, that would be something to find out if when we when we do the uh, if we decide to, to uh, lease it again for that amount of years, what are they raising on these crops on the on the farmland? And uh, I don't believe anybody around here is raising any hemp at this point. And two hundred dollars an acre was it two hundred dollars an acre? Was that right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's that's a good rent for around here. Yeah, but you know, I mean, we still need to, yeah, to still need to evaluate if we can get more, we should try to get more, you know, for this uh, for this land to cover the expenses and everything. That's my position on that. And what about the rental houses? What are we, are we, uh, do you know the lease amount of what we rent, renting those for? Yes, we're releasing those for eight hundred dollars a month. Okay. Is that going rent in Elizabeth City area? I believe that's a low, low number. But uh, again, looking at a market study will help us to identify what that should be. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is, 
chair that uh, I think you're still muted. Uh, uh, thank you, so thank you Trustee Brown. Did you have a question, Trustee Kim Brown? Trustee Kim Brown, your hand was raised. All righty, I would turn that meeting, the meeting yes, back over. I was, uh, I was unmuting, unmuting. Okay. I was slow to hit the space bar. <laughs> it's okay. um, Trustee Bosenworth answered the question. I was going to ask the expert, Trustee Swain, you know, for those of us from the city, I, you know, I had no clue on what a good acreage rent would have been. So I was going to ask the, the experts. And when she said, you know, that that was a good rent, I'm, I'm good with that. I just wanted to make sure we were getting whatever was fair. Great. As Tracy Swain, uh, Trustee Bosworth is correct for this area. That's probably higher than normal. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? Uh, no, Mr. Grimes, do you have anything else to say on your issues you discussed? No, sir. That is all that I have for the, uh, the committee at this time. Thank you very much. We're moving to technology update. Uh, Mr. Esch? Yes, sir. There are no um, action items under his report, uh, just information. All right. Good morning. Can morning. you all hear me? Yes. Good morning. Yes. Yes. All right, I'd like to start off with uh, our introduction to our new, newest member of the IT team. Um, we have Amy Idris who joined us in April as our information security officer, uh, replacing John Husfield. Um, Munir comes up, uh, comes with, uh, with 10 years of experience in uh, security and information uh, assurance. Um, we are glad to have him on board. Uh, he'll be continuing uh, the projects uh, John Husfield was leading. Moving to the next slide, this is related to the COVID-19 response. We had a series of mini projects, basically transition from on-campus operation to remote operation for business continuity. And uh, we had to do this uh, in a very short uh, uh, period. And uh, we, we were glad that we invested uh, in cloud technologies over uh, the last three years, uh, which enabled us to make the transition very easily um, and uh, seamlessly. So um, in terms of the mini projects, we, we first implemented uh, the web collaboration tools, which enabled um, end users to continue the same uh, on-site collaboration using uh, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and SharePoint. We also enabled the remote desktop application to just use the web browser. All you needed is to have a brow web browser to connect to your uh, campus desktop to continue working on the same projects you have been working on campus. As I already mentioned, uh, because of, of our investment in cloud-based technology, we were able to open access to all the applications uh, via, via the firewall, and uh, we were able to transition access uh, to all the web-based application in less than three days uh, period. There was a, 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 a uptake in, in the ticket counts uh, help the ticket counts related to uh, resetting password. Uh, though we have a, a password reset portal, which use a question, uh, which uses security questionnaires, uh, we wanted to make it m even much uh, easier um, for end user to change and manage their accounts. So we enabled um, resetting password using their personal emails. Due to the high demand in access from, uh, from remote location to a campus application, we had to... Uh, hey, I must not do that. 
we uh, uh, we we also had to upgrade our uh, the virtual uh, VPN application, uh, which provided as more a secure access to all the applications. Uh, the next project, which was um, which we implemented, was uh, installing uh, soft phones, which were basically a, a, a mobile app or uh, application uh, app which can be installed on your desktop or laptop uh, or your mobile device to make uh, and receive calls as of you are sitting in your office using your uh, published ECSU phone number. And uh, um, Dr. Ward has already touched on the, the, the project on electronic signature, which basically eliminates the need to print, scan, and ship documents. Um, and everything can be done from anywhere as long as you have an internet enabled device, uh, which are uh, still legally binding documents. Uh, Dr. Ward also touched on this um, uh, student equipment loaner program. Um, there was a huge demand for laptops uh, and hotspots, and uh, our team was able to um, use refurbished uh, uh, laptops and any available laptops on, on campus and ship them overnight to students uh, and, um, you know, take care of any technology needs, uh, including providing uh, support during the entire uh, loaner program uh, period. That concludes uh, my presentation. Any, any questions? If, if there are no questions, um, thank you very much, um, Suresh, for your report. Thank you, sir. And if there are no other questions, uh, without objection, uh, we'll move to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Barnes. Trustee Culpepper, you have the floor, sir. Okay, you caught me by surprise. I thought we were gonna have a break. <laughs> <laughs> I invite the trustees to take the break as needed individually. Thank you. <laughs> Let me uh, get my information out here. <laughs> I'm sorry. No problem. I want to call the meeting of the finance budget and audit committee order first order of business is to read the uh, instructions because this is a call meeting and because it's electronic and because i can hardly see i'll have to read it carefully and as chair of the committee i want to remind everyone that we will be conducting today's meeting pursuant to the new amendments to the Open Meetings Act that apply during states of emergency. The amendment was signed into law and allowed the public bodies to meet the electronic, by, by electronic means. The new law does require, however, that we take all votes as roll call which we will do today. Additionally, the pursuit in the amendment to the law, all chats, instant messages, text, or other virtual communications between members of the board regarding the business of the public business during the remote meetings are deemed to be public record. Finally, I will ask all committee members, board members, and participants, staff to please identify yourself uh, before participating in deliberation, including uh, making motions, proposing uh, amendments, and making points of order. Um, 
At this point, we'd like to take roll call. Ms. Sandler, if you sure. would. Uh, call Pepper, you will also need to include the um, ethics statement. It follows the, the, the statement that you just read. Before the roll call? Yes, Ms. please. As chair of the um, Finance Committee, it is my responsibility to remind all members of the board and this committee of their duty under the State Government Ethics Act to avoid conflict of interest and apparent of conflict of interest as required by this act. Each member has received an agenda and related information for the Board of Trustees Committee meeting. If any board member knows of any conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with regard to any matter coming before the Board of Trustees at this meeting, the conflict or appearance of conflict should be identified at this time. Now we we'll have the board and have the roll call. Yes. Finance, audit, and strategic planning. Trustees, Andy Culpepper. You know you're present. Kim present. Brown. Present. Lynn Bunch. Present. Chris Evans. Present. And Kenneth Wilkins. Present. Okay, so you have a quorum. We have a quorum. Yes. Uh, we have had before you the minutes of last uh, meeting. Do we have a motion to approve them? So moved. Kenneth Wilkins. Motion by Kenny. Kim Brown, Kenneth. second. Second that motion. There's a second. Uh, do we have to have a roll call? I think we do. To yes, sir, we do to approve the minutes. Yes, sir. Um, Andy Culpepper? Approved. Kim Brown? Approved. Lynn Bunch? Approved. Chris Evans? Approved. And Kenneth Wilkins? Approved. Thank you. We may continue. Thank you. With that, I call on Lisa McClinton, our Vice Chancellor, of business and finance to bring us up to speed on business and finance. Good afternoon, trustees. Hope everyone is doing well. I just shared my screen. With that, we get started. Um, as of this information is as of March 31st, 2020. Um, as if you recall back in the early March meeting, we was still uh, experiencing the shortfall of revenue. But as you can see, as, as of March 31st, our total budget of 40, uh, approximately $40.1 million. We have actually uh, had a surplus of revenues at 74%, and we have spent only 73%, which is pretty much on target because you should be spending 25% of your budget each year. So that uh, projected revenue shortfall was really covered from, of course, salary, and fringe, uh, lap salary and fringe benefits, as well as a reduction in spend it due to COVID-19. As you know, our operations kind of went into a remote operation. So a lot of things that was probably which travel and things like that was actually, um, you know, reduced. So that is good news because of course we are with no budget for our fiscal year, as well as uh, not having a, a hole that makes us in a better position at June 30th. As of the fiscal year 20, our trust funds, our trust funds, um, and this is really good, especially since we had, um, you know, the COVID-19 had to pay out refunds of housing and dining. Our um, unrestricted balances at the beginning of the year was 1.68, but the unrestricted as of March 31st is 2.1. And that is, it would have been a lot higher, of course, at March 31st, but we actually had to pay out the refunds so it reduced it, but it's actually back up to around the same amount because we actually got reimbursed for our um, refunds that we had to pay out for students for housing and dining. And you can actually see some of this detail in your breakdown of your materials in your book. Now let's talk about our finance outlook for fiscal year 20 as well as 21. Just to give you an update for the fiscal year 2021, you know, they're still in the talks about a budget. Hopefully we get a budget this year. But one thing that has already been approved is 
we're getting $772,000 from state aid for COVID relief funding that's coming to the school and it's going to actually be split in two forms. We're actually getting, I, I think, approximately $200,000, $300,000 this year, and then the rest will get um, be given to us next fiscal year. And this money actually has a lot of guidelines that the state set and it has to be spent for COVID relief funding. So most of our hours probably will go to facilities, um, temporary housekeeping um, to keep our buildings safe and clean. And this money also has to be spent by December 31st. So the money that they give us actually this year has to be spent by June 30th. And then the money that we get next year has to be spent by December 31st. And that was um, guidelines that the state has put in place. So of course we will plan to spend this money first. Fiscal year 2021, as you know, there is no tuition fee increase this year for our coming up fiscal year. Um, due to the COVID-19, the Board of Governors pretty much wasn't a good environment for asking for a tuition and fee increase. That kind of does imp uh, impact us a little bit, of course, because we asked for a tuition and fee increase across um, certain auxiliary units too. But what we went on and did is we went on and removed that increased revenue that they was expecting for 2021, and we just backed their budget back down to as it was in 20. Um, we just talked about a bit about a CARES Act funding. I, I'm not going to spend a lot on the 1.6 because uh, Provost Ward covered that. But like she said, we did spend pretty much 99%, and we plan to spend that $6.50 in fiscal year uh, 21. But we did receive another 1.6 million of that campus use, and that was used to refund housing and um, dining refunds. Uh, I can see that uh, Shernita Parker, her microphone's on. That may be causing the feedback. Okay. Sorry about that. Our housing and our dining refunds was actually $1.3 million. The first 1.06 only really covered majority of housing, which was like nine fifty nine. dollars But of that third pot of money, we got the two point eight four. dollars We took $300,000 from that to cover dining. So... The good news is COVID-19, despite having the move out, we was able to recover all the money that we had to spend out, which was a, a, a good plus, which has also led us into the Moody's update. Because um, as you know, and I'm sure you've seen the announcement, Moody's, we went through a, a review of Moody's, I know, during the spike in COVID-19, but they wanted, they asked for a whole lot of reports. They wanted to ensure that we were still stable and they affirm our rating at BAA2, which was some great news and still gave us a stable outlook. Um, and this was due to all this extra money that we got from CARES as well as the state and the continued state support. One of their main concerns is liquidity and making sure our unrestricted balances can rise a little bit. But the good thing about the BAA2 was if um, you know anything about the ratings, we do have our rating is higher than uh, Warhouse, as well as Howard Universities, which is outstanding HBCUs. So that is just to give you a, because they BWA, they BAA3 and we BAA2. So we are great higher than them. But um, just to give you that update, that was some really good news to have going into the Moody's update. And I think that is it for me. Do you have any questions? Any questions from anybody? Thank you for your report, then, Lisa. Thank now we'll, you. Now we we'll call on uh, our chief, chief audit officer, who's trying, I, I, apparently very anxious to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, here she go right here. You can talk now. There you go. Good morning. I am Sharnita Parker, the Chief Audit Officer, and my update will include informational items only. There were two reports completed, but only one was released. 
Once we, rec um, when we complete a report and find exceptions, we give departments the opportunity to validate any exceptions that we find before the report is finally released. So that can take additional time. So my focus will be on the one report that was released and that was university advancement operations. This review focused on the operational functions of the Office of University, University, I'm sorry, University Advancement. And this review identified three recommendations. And based on these recommendations, we will do a follow-up report in the near future. That concludes my update. Do you have any questions for me in regards to that report? Any, any questions for anybody? Then is there a motion to adjourn? Um, we, you can, you, we don't actually need a, a motion to adjourn, sir. You can. And we are adjourned. We, okay. <laughs> Thank you, trustee. All righty. Uh, if we are ready to call on trustee Paul Tyne. All right. You're there, I, sir. Great. I'm here. I call the uh, committee on regional development to order. And as chair of the committee, I want to remind everyone that we'll be conducting today's meeting pursuant to the new amendments to the Open Meetings Act that apply during states of emergency. The amendments were signed into law and allow for public bodies to meet via electronic means. The new law does require, however, that we take all votes via roll call, which we will do today. Additionally, pursuant to the amendments to the law, all chats, instant messages, texts, and other written communications between members of the board regarding the transaction of the public business during the remote meeting are deemed a public record. Finally, I will ask all committee members, board members, and participating staff to please identify yourself before participating in deliberations, including making motions, proposing amendments, and raising points of order. As chair of the Committee on Regional Development, it is my responsibility to remind all members of the board of their duty under the State Government Ethics Act to avoid conflicts of interest and appearance of conflict of interest as required by this act. Each member has received the agenda and related information for this Board of Trustees committee meeting. If any board member knows of any conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any matter coming before the Board of Trustees at this meeting, the conflict or appearance of conflict should be identified at this time. Hearing nothing, I will ask for um, roll call to be taken, please. Okay. For attendance. Committee on Regional Development, roll call. Paul Tyne. Present. Harold Barnes. Phyllis Bosomworth. Present. Kim Brown. Present. Lynn Bunch. Present. And Andy Culpepper. Present. You do have a quorum. Thank you very much. And I will go ahead and recognize Dr. Wilkins to uh, make his uh, informational items. Chair of Tyne, if I may, um, we do need to do a motion uh, for uh, 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 minutes. Yeah. Please. Uh, I'm looking for a motion. Andy Culpepper, so moved. I have um, um, Andy Culpepper has moved to approve the minutes. Uh, is there a second? Harold Barnes, second. Thank you very much. If the roll call will be taken, please. Roll call for minutes. Paul Tyne. Aye. Harold Barnes. Aye. Phyllis Bosomworth. Aye. Kim Brown. Approved, aye. Lynn Bunch. Aye. And Andy Culpepper. Aye. Thank you. All right, at this time, I will recognize Dr. Wilkins in order to make his presentation. Thank you, uh, Trustee Tyne. Good afternoon, members of the board. I have a brief presentation to provide a regional uh, development update. Uh, since our last meeting in March, of course, COVID-19, uh, became a neighbor, so therefore it began to restrict 
uh, some of the activities. However, it created an opportunity for one of our offices on campus, which is the Small Business and Technology Development Center. I'm uh, sharing the region that our center services. If you look at the counties in blue, uh, those are the counties that are serviced by our SBTDC office on our campus. Uh, the blue and the yellow represent the 21 county service region. Uh, of course, you will see the counties uh, closer to the coast and northeast are the ones serviced by our campus. Uh, there are SPDDCs located at East Carolina University and other universities across the state. So this is the reason why our counties are restricted to the counties that we have uh, identified. When we look at the activity provided by the SPTDC uh, during this uh, last uh, quarter uh, or since March 15th, we see that there uh, has been an increase in activity uh, that the office has provided. We provided as a point of reference the uh, data for the period of January through March the 14th. And then we looked at the data for March 15th to uh, the 29th of May. And so you will see here the businesses served in uh, March 15th through the 29th, 136. Uh, the business counseling hours are 449. And we see that the capital formation created a 3 million uh, uh, plus. And then the jobs created and retained, we are at 387. Uh, one of the questions that we had as we looked at the data was how did we uh, increase uh, the funding and also the businesses served uh, with less counseling hours. Uh, but the reason is uh, Mr. Michael Tritty, who is the director, he did share with me that the counseling that they provided during COVID-19 uh, situations, uh, it was a very fast paced process, fast turnaround. So therefore they could spend on an average of three and a quarter hours counseling businesses for COVID related uh, transactions. Whereas uh, for normal businesses outside of the COVID window, uh, they spend about 11 hours per client. And so these are the numbers uh, for the period of March 15th through May 29th. You see the year to date uh, totals um, for the Small Business and Technology Development Center. The Business North Carolina uh, published a journal online and there was an article in the May issue uh, where they featured uh, an article from ECSU. Uh, what I want to direct your attention to uh, is just to quote at the very bottom of this page, which says, uh, which is a quote by one of their clients, if you own a business on the Outer Banks, uh, Matthew, who is an employee at ECSU and our SPTDC, he be in your corner. Uh, Matthew had assisted one of the clients on the Outer Banks in uh, some of their business needs. And so the client uh, expressed his appreciation uh, for Matthew and, our, and the services we provide. The SBTDC at ECSU has been led by uh, Mr. Michael Tritty. He has been employed at ECSU for 34 years. And uh, Michael uh, has rendered his uh, retirement plans. His, so therefore in August, he will be retiring from ECSU after 34 years of service. We have invited him to just to be on the call today so he could hear the expression of gratitude, uh, thanking uh, him for his service to our SBTD center, and we do wish him well as he moves into retirement. Thank you, Mr. Twitty. I would like to invite our trustees to unmute and give Mr. Michael Twitty a round of applause for his years of service. Thank you, Michael. 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 Thank you for your service. I felt very much. I appreciate it. That was my kind. Of Derek, you just told me I could be here to answer questions. But anyway, I, I appreciate it. It's been a great 34 years. Um, I've been awesome working at the university and serving in the northeastern area. So uh, thank you very much.
Thank you. Those applause came with virtual hugs too, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Very Hope much. you felt them. All right. I, I did. I did. Good. Good. Okay, so the other part of our conversation uh, centers around the uh, impact of COVID-19 on our strategic plan, uh, trustee time, uh, and I had a brief discussion around that. So we just wanted to see as it relates to uh, the regional development uh, strategic initiative, with initiative number six, uh, what was the impact of COVID-19? Well, we looked at our our uh, goals for the strategic initiative. And we only had one goal, fortunately, in the July 2020 uh, 20 through June 21 period that we said we would accomplish. The other goals are present. However, they go beyond the June 2021. So we're sharing that the goal that we said that we would accomplish uh, in this year, the first year of the plan, uh, would be to create and utilize a board of visitors for premier and signature programs uh, for further uh, to further engage community members and businesses. So we're happy to report COVID will not impact this uh, particular uh, goal that we have said that we will accomplish within this time frame. So the time we come back together, uh, we should uh, begin to have some discussions around. Uh, shaping up our board of visitors. Uh, and as Trustee Tan mentioned in the March meeting, uh, we will uh, ask the trustees at the appropriate time to make recommendations for consideration uh, for members to the board of visitors. Uh, the other uh, goals that we uh, did identify, uh, we talked about bringing you know, people to campus, uh, but this is gonna be a five-year plan. And of course, COVID will have an impact on how we engage uh, the public uh, at the university. Uh, but just as soon as we were able to uh, move again with getting people to be invited to events on campus, we will. Trustee Tan, that concludes my report. Uh, are there any questions? Trustee um, Bond, I have a question, uh, if it's okay. The, the um, when we talk about when we're developing our strategic plan about uh, how we look at ourselves in terms of the area that we service, uh, I thought we were going to try to get away from just saying, you know, a 21 county area because we, one, uh, it doesn't include Pitt, and two, we service almost the whole state. So do we want to continue using that as an identification of, of who we serve? Sir, I agree with you. Uh, we shared that in light of the service region for SBDC uh, because the state does define uh, their region. And so I was just showing that in light of the surrounding counties, just in case there were some other questions about perhaps why don't we serve Pitt County or another county? And the reason would be that there are SBTDCs in these other areas, but I agree we're not restricting our steps to the 21 counties. Got it, I understand. Dr. Wilkins, um, so just to clarify, when um, the leadership met in regards to making any adjustments to the strategic plan uh, that as they relate to us, we had um, in year one identified according to our minutes, we had 6.1.6, 6.2.3, 6 6.3.2, and 6.3.4. So we had uh, four different things in year one. Are we backing those off to uh, the one, which is the Board of Visitors? Well, the, the Board of Visitors, Trustee Todd, is the only one that is uh, to be scheduled to be completed in year one. The others uh, don't end in year one because they go across the years. And so the reason we lifted out the one that was completed, that is scheduled to be completed in year one is because again, in 12 months, we are to really say that we have checked that one off. Okay. Uh, so so the uh, other ones, we might we like for 6.1.6, increase the utilization of SPTDC. Uh, there will be some activity going on in that one. We just did not say that it will conclude after year one. 
So one of the things that I was wondering about is because this committee in particular was really relying on bringing people to the to the campus and a lot of outreach and um, you know the the uh, the artistic um, items that were being done. So um, what I'm looking for as we move forward is is are there adjustments to those or are we going to continue to um, keep those uh, as initiatives that we're working on in year one that we need to make some adjustments to, you know, based on how we do them, obviously, you know, yes. bringing people on, uh, or are some of those being sort of uh, put on the back burner until we can, you know, get things up and running again. So uh, if we could just, for our next meeting, have some, a little more clarification on that. So um, you know, because as we know, we're here to assist you. And so whichever ones you want us to work on will help and whatever ones you want us to put on the back corner, we'll do that. Yes, Trustee Tan, thank you. Uh, the only one that we might have a challenge with, but we, this is to be determined based on COVID, would be the 6.3.2, uh, where we are developing a series of five annual events to bring people to the campus. Uh, the other events that we have for the activities that we said we would accomplish, I think we, we will see some traction in them in year one. Okay. Are there any other, thank you very much, Dr. Wilkins. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments from uh, Jesse Colbeck? Yeah, I, I, I don't mean to be picky, but do we teach geography uh, at the university? Probably not. But I asked, I asked Dr. Wilkins to look at the map and that he's showing us and look at the list of the SBTDC service region. And the first county he's got up there is Alexander. And I'm not sure that Alexander is a county in the eastern part of the state. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Call Pepper, let me clarify that legend. Uh, the, the legend there uh, is a legend to the counties in the state where they cannot write the county out on the on the map. And so that legend there only represents where Alexander County is. They could only put one over there uh, because they cannot write the word Alexander over there. So the counties that I've listed in the top is just a legend that came with this map. Uh, these are not our service counties. Our service counties are in the blue. So the numbers don't mean anything. The blues on the map versus the numbers on your on the side. Yes, the numbers just represent the entire state where they cannot spell out the county because of the size of the state on the map. Well, do they have Alexander County as their service region? Oh no, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But but do they have Northampton and? Uh, do they have Hyde? Yes, sir. Our service regions are all of those counties which are in blue, which would be Hyde, Washington County, and then Dare, uh, Dare County. Yes, sir. All of these in the blue. In the blue, but it, so that list you gave us one through uh, all those with the numbers mean absolutely nothing. Trustee Culpepper, this is Paul Tyne again, and I'm. If you look at the map. The map has counties. Sometimes it lists the name. Sometimes it it lists yeah. number where it couldn't yeah. write the name in the county space. So those numbers off to the side are only a um, a key to identifying the counties that have numbers listed instead of names. The the service area is correctly portrayed in the map, as well as what counties should be included in that. Okay. Do we have any other questions um, from board of trustees or committee members? The um, trustee Barnes for a second. Can I jump in for just sir. a second? Um, I also would like for us to consider on this committee uh, what opportunities does this uh, pandemic bring that we may be able to take opportunity, take advantage of that we would not have been able to take advantage of otherwise. So. In every negative thing, there's something positive or there's an opportunity there. So 
at least uh, the members of the committee, if we see something that is very, very positive for us that we can take advantage of under this particular committee, then I, I think we should continue to look for that. Absolutely, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, Michael Twitty for 34 years of work with uh, this uh, fine institution. Um, and we wish you the very best. Uh, you're not quite leaving us, I don't believe. It's uh, June, or is it soon? Dr. Wilkins, is he leaving soon? I believe it's August. August. Uh, okay, August. Mm -hmm. well, we wish you well, and thank you. And without objection, we will stand adjourned. Thank you, Trustee Ty. All righty, I would like to thank everyone, all our committee chairs and our trustees who are back on time and on schedule. And with that, I'd like to call to order our Governance, Executive and Personnel Committee. Uh, can I do that? I'm a little early. Am I all right? I'm at 12.45, what time is it? It's 12.37. So 12.45, thank you. So we need, to, oh, this is a break time, Trustee Culpepper. Thank All right, you. we'll be back in our seats at 1245. <laughs> Thank you.
Madam Chair, we are live. All righty, I will wait for 1245 time before I begin. Thank you. Hello, I would like to call the Governance, Executive and Personality, I'm sorry, and Personnel Committee of the Board of Trustees to order. I welcome you all, and I would like to ask if Gwen Sanders would do the roll call for us. Uh, Chair Robinson, if you would please start with reading your statement. Oh, yes, thank you. I am off and running here. As Chair of the Committee, I want to remind everyone that we will be conducting today's meeting pursuant to the new amendments to the Open Meetings Act that apply during states of emergency. The amendments were signed into law and allow for public bodies to meet via electronic means. The new law does require, however, that we take all votes via roll call, which we will do today. Additionally, pursuant to the amendments to the law, all chats, instant messages, text, or other written communications between members of the board regarding the transaction of the public business during the remote meeting are deemed a public record. Finally, I will ask all committee members, board members, and participating staff to please identify yourself before participating in deliberations, including making motions, proposed amendments, and raising points of order. As chair of the person of the uh, I'm sorry, governance, executive, and personnel committee, it is my responsibility to remind all members of the board of their duty under the State Government Ethics Act to avoid conflicts of interest and appearances of conflict of interest as required by this act. Each member has received the agenda and related information for this board of trustees committee meeting. If any board member knows of any conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any matter coming before the board of trustees at this meeting, the conflict or appearance of conflict should be identified at this time. Hearing none, I will request the roll call. Roll call for governance, executive and personnel. Trustees, Jan King Robinson. Present. Lynn Bunch. Present. Stephanie Johnson. Present. Harold Barnes. Harold Barnes. Kim Brown. Present. Present. Andy Culpepper. Andy Culpepper. And Paul Tyne. Present. Do we have a quorum? We do have a quorum. Ms. Sanders? Okay, yes. thank you. We'll continue. Uh, before we move to the staff updates, I would just like to uh, make a couple comments to the committee. Um, as you know, we every year do a board self-evaluation. And while our strategic plan, the board's strategic planning goals will not be in place until July, we still think we could take advantage of learning uh, and applying those goals loosely to what we've achieved over this last year. So I'll be meeting uh, with you all. Um, I'll send you again the draft board about self-evaluation and ask for your input vis-a-vis -vis what we hope to accomplish as we look back on what we did accomplish. Uh, also, uh, the chancellor and I are going to start talking about uh, the feasibility of having a board retreat, whether that makes sense. So for this body, I would really like for you to consider that and to think under these circumstances, if that would be something of value and what kinds of topics you think would be uh, most germane and helpful. Uh, we'll also be getting input from the chancellor on that topic. Uh, and those are my, my comments. And so I'm going to turn to Mrs. Paula Bow for an update on human resources. 
Madam Chair, we need to move back to get a motion Oops. and a second for the approval of the minutes and then That's the right. um, roll call vote, please. That's right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm rolling here. <laughs> so thank you for pulling me back. We need a motion on the minutes, approval for the minutes. Trustee Barnes moved to approve the minutes. Thank you. I we need a second. This is Kim Brown, and I second. I want to thank the chair for not making me feel bad for not oh, following all the rules earlier. <laughs> You're going to feel golden by the time I finish. Thank you. Okay, our second. All righty. Madam uh, Sanders, would you please do the roll call for the approval of the minutes? Indeed. Jan King Robinson? Yes. Lynn Bunch? Yes. Stephanie Johnson? Yes. Harold Barnes? Aye. Kim Brown? Yes. Andy Culpepper? Yes. And Paul Tyne? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'd like to call on Mrs. Pola Ball to provide us with a human resources update. Good afternoon, board members. You have been provided with a summary of the personnel actions that have occurred since the last board meeting. And so I ask at this time if you have any questions regarding that report. Okay, uh, if there are no questions, then I'll turn it over to Alan for his legal affairs update. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I need to provide my update in closed session, so I will hold until that time period. All right, I think that we're there. Well, actually, let me make a few comments before we go into closed session. Um, uh, at, no, I'm sorry. I can. I will come out of closed session. I'll make my closing comments. So I think, um, Trustee Bunch, are you prepared to make that motion for us? Yes. Thank you. I move that we go into closed session in accordance with North Carolina General Statute 143-318. Dot 11, section A3, to consult with our attorney to protect the attorney-client privilege, and section A5 of the statute that to establish or to instruct the public body staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the public body in negotiating the price and other material terms of a contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease, and Section A6 of the statute to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee, or to hear or investigate a complaint, charge, or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee. Thank you. You've heard the motion. Do I have a second? I need a second. Yes, second. Stephanie Johnson, I second. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? We require a, a roll call, uh, Ms. Sanders. For this roll vote. Call.
Madam Chair, we are live. All righty, thank you. Uh, just a few uh, comments and then we'll be able to adjourn. I really appreciate that we are right on schedule. I just want to uh, say thank you to uh, Trustee Bruce Brown that you were able to be with us. I wasn't sure you were going to make the June meeting, so we're delighted you're here with us and look forward to seeing you tomorrow, which will be your, your last official board meeting. Also, I wanted to let the board know that today I'm going to be sending you a very, I hope, short uh, email that I will definitely need your uh, feedback on. Uh, I will also copy our chancellor. So I'll send that to you late this afternoon. It's something I would like to do at tomorrow's meeting, but I would like to do it with the full support of our entire board. If, I, if that does not happen, no, no problem. Um, I will make adjustments. So um, I'll send that out to you later on this afternoon. Uh, I appreciate everybody. Um, if there is nothing else for us to conduct today, uh, does anybody have anything else? Hearts, minds, all free and clear? I thank you all very much. And without objection, we stand adjourned. Have a blessed day, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.